at the various different speeds we need to operate the ship at. But the, the remit is wide ranging across the ship from, from the engine room. If we go up into the accommodation, uh, we need to make sure the toilets are working and that there's, there's hot water for showers. It's all the small things that you don't think about that take up all the time in day to day operation. If someone's always asking you, can you just do this and can you, can you do that? So you're running around doing different things, which keeps it varied. The best bit of the job um, is getting the Antarctica and the uh, Arctic, just because um, on a normal ship, you're going from A to B, you, you, you see land occasionally and you, you hardly get off, but if we get to go and see penguin colonies um, and, and the bases and, and help scientists with all their, their research, it, it just it, we're part of the bigger picture, which is something you don't get on a normal commercial ship. The polar regions are home to many kinds of wildlife. Penguins live in colonies with populations larger than some cities. They are excellent swimmers and travel vast distances on foot or by tobogganing. This is where they slide over the ice on their bellies, propelled by their feet and wings. They keep warm by standing together in groups called huddles. Over time, the huddle shifts so no penguin is on the outside for too long. Luckily, polar bears live on the other side of the globe, so we don't have to worry about being eaten. Penguins live in Antarctica, while polar bears are only found in the Arctic. The Arctic gets its name from Arctos, the Greek word for bear. This is because the Great Bear and Little Bear constellations can only be seen in the Northern Hemisphere. In the past, you might have seen huskies helping explorers in Antarctica, but they were removed in 1994, so they didn't spread diseases to native creatures. So the Sir David Attenborough as a new polar vessel for the UK really represents a massive investment but also a massive commitment to doing science in the polar regions. And that's really important because they're some of the fastest changing areas on Earth. We also need to understand the role of the polar regions and how it controls the climates and oceanography of the whole world. So having a ship that can go and get through some of the most difficult conditions in the world is really important in terms of doing good science that can help humanity. Because of its size, it has the opportunity to bring in scientists from all around the world um, and form international collaborations that work on multidisciplinary sciences. We have a moon pool where, when we are in the deep ice, can deploy equipment through that hole that goes through the whole hull of the vessel. And we can take samples in a way we haven't taken them before. Essentially you could study everything from microbes to whales. My colleagues who are geologists are going to use deep water coring devices. That's a big tube that goes down to the bottom of the sea and will sink into the mud and collect a sample of that mud in order. And those different layers are like the rings of a tree and they tell you different things about the oceanography and the climate at the time the mud was laid down at the bottom of the sea. Also, it gives scientists the ability to get to remote regions who might be working on land. One of the good things about the Sir David Attenborough is going to be the amount of autonomous vehicles we can use. So there's going to be ocean gliders, which go... ...that can plug into the ship. We have aquarium containers where we can keep animals alive from the deep sea for a long time and see what they do, how they act. Somewhere and that's just from places we know about. So the potential to go and look in the deep sea where everything we find might be new to science. For me, that's really important that we understand what we have now before it's too late. So my dad uh, was in the Royal Navy and when he would come home from sea he would have all these jobs that everything had broken while he'd been away. From a very, very young age I just start helping him, passing him the tools and eventually he taught me how to do it and now he just sits and watches me do it. <laughs> I've got such a passion for how
something so interesting. Although I'm working down below the, the waterline with no windows around, the navigation officers are on strict instructions to contact me if there's orca sightings or if we can see some seals playing and penguins on the rocks or icebergs and they'll phone down and let us know when something good's going on upstairs so we can go out and see it. The ship, the, the Sir David Attenborough, will take UK scientists and our international collaborators literally to the ends of the earth to try and understand what is happening in those regions. What's happening there is really critical for us all on this planet. It's really urgent that we take the ship to the polar regions now. The climate is changing faster than it ever has done before. Through this state-of-the-art new ship, the British Antarctic Survey will help to expand global knowledge of the polar oceans and the impact of climate change on this crucial region. This ship represents an opportunity to go to places that we've never been able to go to before. Places that are too extreme for our current capabilities. The very deepest parts of the ocean, the iciest parts of Antarctica, the most remote places that most ships couldn't get to and work in with the amount of fuel they carry. This really is a new way of working. We're now going to be able to go and look at animals in six and a half thousand metres of water. And we will go and do that on some of the first cruises and we'll go and make some measurements in those areas for the first time. The particular thing that I've always enjoyed is to go on and feel like you have a unified purpose to go out, explore what's in the ocean, working in these unique areas. Sir David Attenborough has a huge range of new facilities. It's so hard to pick just one cool or exciting example, but the first would maybe be the scientific moon pool, which is basically... piston corer. We can actually collect about 40 metres of mud and sand and the layers of sediment at the bottom of the ocean um, and that's about three or four times more than we could get with our existing equipment and research vessels. So there could be no more important function than those which are going to be dealt with by this remarkable ship at the cutting edge of science. It's no news to any of you that the world at the moment is facing great, great problems. And the most aware of that are the young people of today who will inherit this world. Great problems require great research and facts in order to solve them. That's what this astonishing ship will be here to do, to find out the facts, to find the science with which to deal with the problems that are facing the world today and will increasingly do so tomorrow. As many of you know, Camel Earth has an unrivaled history. Some of the greatest ships ever built have been launched from our slipways. Great British engineering is here in Birkenhead. And this polar research ship before you is the pride of Merseyside. We thank Sir David Attenborough for lending his name 
for lending his name to this iconic vessel, which go together oh so well. We are, of course, here to celebrate a true British marvel, one that is strong, sturdy, and incredibly well engineered, that deepens our understanding of the impact our behavior has on the world around us, and arms us with the facts to do something about it. An icon capable of feats not seen before and potentially never seen again. And no, I'm not talking about you, David. Those words wouldn't do you and your lifetime's work justice. The RRS Sir David Attenborough is a testament to the cutting edge science and engineering expertise right here on Merseyside. Through this state-of-the-art new ship, the British Antarctic Survey will help to expand global knowledge of the polar oceans and the impact of climate change on this crucial region. As Director of the British Antarctic Survey, this is an incredibly proud day for me and I would really like to thank everybody here in Camel Laird who've helped build this ship and to everyone in the British Antarctic Survey, engineers, project people, mariners and scientists who've helped design this ship. And we're incredibly excited and proud to take this ship to the ends of the earth to try and predict our future. It gives me great pleasure to name this ship Sir David Attenborough, and may God bless her and all those who sail in her. It is a great possibility. Good luck, good fortune to everyone who will sail and work with her. Thank you very much. So I work a 50% of a full-time contract in Brighton A&E, so I probably work three or four months of a year, very closely packed contract, and then the rest of the time I can come and do things like this. So it works really well, I keep up my skills um, by doing the A&E work, whereas if you did just this as a doctor, you would de-skill over time. So we're quite well set up on the ship, so we have the surgery itself and then a ward beside that where if we had to have patients um, isolated or for other reasons nursed, we could keep them in there, so they've got some hospital beds. We have a, a resource facility, um, we have an x-ray machine and digital developer, um, have the ability to do plaster casting, um, we can do basic um, sort of manipulations, sedations, that kind of thing. But, you know, I am only one person, so there is a limit to what you can do. This is a really exciting moment for us all. You know, this ship, the Sir David Attenborough, I've, I've seen it evolve from a pile of steel on the, on the floor of the shipyard into now into this amazing state-of-the-art science ship that's going to allow us to do science that we've never done before. I mean, along with its massively important science impact, this ship is a, is a massive boost for us to fly the flag for UK PLC across the world. It's a huge boost for Merseyside and the northwest of England in general. 
it's not just the four or five hundred people directly employed in the yard. The offshoots into the supply chain all around the port will be massive. The actual project value will disseminate into the local area in a large way. And, and you know, the other thing is that the skills that it will develop will allow us to use this as a platform for a much, hopefully, brighter export future of similar specialist ship around the world. To be able for all. Personally, this has been a massive opportunity for myself. This ship can go and change history and to research new stuff and find new stuff and everything about it should change some sort of history for the world. We're incredibly excited. And I wish good luck, good fortune to everyone who will sail and work with her. Thank you very much. Getting what samples they need and this, that and the other. And this place is the winter room, which as you can see is a vast technical marvel, if you want to call it that. As place it needs to be. Uh, when my dad started he joined the shack, the old Shackleton um, in the 60s, um, went on to the Bransford in the 70s um, yeah, and then I joined straight from school in 1986. Um, my son joined about four years ago and yeah so we're sort of a third generation of a, our family that have been working on these ships. started with Hamlet as an apprentice plater, came here to finish my apprenticeship. When I first started work I did feel like I was out of my depth because I never worked with structural ship drawings or anything like that. The support of supervisors and management have guided us in the right direction. Working on the Sir David Attenborough ship has made me realise that I'm happy with the career choice I've made. It's also given me the drive and inspiration to continue chasing my career and progress through the ranks. I think it's important that the ship is built locally because it's been used by the British Antarctic Survey. It's also good for the economy, it's provided a lot of jobs. My PhD is using gliders to look at mixing in the West Antarctic. Warm salty water at depth gets mixed upwards to the base of the ice shelves, causing the ice shelves to melt from below. So I'm hoping to further our, our understanding of some of these processes that are occurring. The processes that are happening around Antarctica will affect everyone. So to anyone who is interested in getting into this field, I would say try and keep a strong mass and physics background and really just try and take any opportunities you can to get any field work or any research experience in the area that you're interested in. One of the best things about working in Birkenhead is that I get to go home to my little girl every night. When I come from my site to Camelhead, this was me coming home. To be able to get this opportunity to come and work on this ship, but then also Camelhead overall, this has been a massive opportunity for myself. Being a woman in our industry, yes, we are the minority, but at the same time, it's open for everyone. Whether it is being like a draftsman on a computer or whether it is being on production on the shop floor like myself, there is every opportunity to take it. It is a massive challenge every day, but everything is different and you're always learning. The fact that I could go on to something else, that's something different, that's a new challenge, that's just all I'd ever ask for. In 2014, the UK government announced £200 million in funding for one of the most advanced polar research vessels in the world. The new ship, owned by the Natural Environment Research Council, part of UK Research and Innovation, replaces the existing polar fleet of the RRS James Clark Ross and RRS Ernest Shackleton. Rolls-Royce worked closely with the scientific community to create its unique design. She's designed to break ice. She's also designed to have a large oceanic range of around 19,000 miles and also at 11 knots The vessel is a 128 metre length, 24 metres beam, full load displacement of around 15,000 tonnes. So it's a, a fairly sizeable ship. 
Construction began at Camel Laird in Birkenhead in 2016 with hundreds of people working on the project. So it was prefabricated blocks and then they come together when we were in the construction hall. The top half was separate to the bottom half and then once we launched down the subway we then stuck the top half on basically. The Ice Strengthened was launched by her namesake Sir David Attenborough in July 2018. Our future and everybody's future will be affected by what people working on this ship, British scientists and others, will be discovering in years to come. The Royal Research Ship Sir David Attenborough will be operated by the British Antarctic Survey and carry up to 60 scientists from pole to pole. The uppermost housing is the conning tower, which gives us much better horizontal visibility when we're in the ice. The next one down is the observation deck. It's a great idea because it means that the people that we're carrying to Antarctica, they've got their own deck that has as good a view as we have on the bridge. Specialist facilities on board include a giant piston cora, moon pool, helideck, autonomous instruments and robotic technologies. So what we've got is a vessel that can take lots of people, can deploy instruments from various different points in different ways, can go into the ice, can take the moon pool that enables us to put equipment into the water even when we've got ice all surrounding the vessel. This ship represents an opportunity to go to places that we've never been able to go to before, places that are too extreme for our current capabilities. The very deepest parts of the ocean, the iciest parts of Antarctica, It's no news to any of you that the world at the moment is facing great, great problems. And the most aware of that are the young people of today who will inherit this world. Great problems require great research and facts in order to solve them. That's what this astonishing ship will be here to do. To find out the facts, to find the science with which to deal with the problems that are facing the world today and will increasingly do so tomorrow. Our future and everybody's future will be affected by what people working on this ship, British scientists and others, will be discovering in years to come. And I thank everyone who has been involved in this wonderful enterprise and wish them huge success when this marvelous ship gets down there in the Antarctic, which we thought was so remote but we should realize now is absolutely crucial to the future of all of us. RRS Sir David Attenborough is one of the world's most advanced polar research vessels. It is 129 meters long, 24 meters wide, holds 600 cubic meters of fuel and has four main engines. Its generator is the size of a small bus. Designed to cope with extreme polar conditions, the strengthened hull and propellers can break ice up to one meter thick. The ship boasts state-of-the-art laboratories so scientists can carry out groundbreaking research. They can deploy a range of remotely piloted scientific instruments and autonomous underwater vehicles such as the famous Boaty McBoatface to capture data from the ocean, the seabed and under the ice front.
It's great living on a ship. Um, they're kind of like small little villages, really. Um, they've got everything you need to survive. They've got water purification, there's a canteen, the science labs, there's the computer rooms, there's the bridge which you can go up and look out to see. Everything's heated, so that's all the outside decks. All the handrails are all heated as well to stop them freezing. You've got a sauna, you've got a nice coffee lounge, and it really is about the social interactions and it really is shipmates. There is that feeling of living and working together. So you need to find your way to work with everybody and appreciate everybody because you rely on each other. Some of the hardest things are being away from family and friends as we can be away for up to two and a half, three months at a time. Communications is incredible. When I first came you, you wrote a letter, now you just pick up the phone. The job itself can be taxing. Maybe we've had a lot of rough weather, so not a lot of sleep and people are a bit groggy. For me, the biggest challenge is uh, sleeping, especially in rough weather. <laughs> Ice breaking uh, is noisy, it can throw you out of bed. We do come complete with our own doctor's surgery and the ship always carries a doctor whilst in polar regions. You have your places where you can calm down after a hard day of work. Most important is, of course, your own cabin. On the new Sir David Edinburgh, we will have cabins for two or a single person, and all of them will have windows to the outside, which will make a huge difference to be able to look out. I might turn around and see nothing one day, but the next day I'll see a dolphin or a sunfish or, or just something that, you know, actually is a pretty unique view. I was left outside and a minke whale came up right next to the ship to have a little rest and a breathe because we'd made a hole in the ice. I was screaming and shouting, is there anybody else to see this? And there wasn't. It just feels like something that is a real privilege. Welcome aboard. The ship can carry up to 90 people. Each person has their own comfortable cabin. No motion. The ship is a floating city and has everything you could need to live and work at sea. From state-of-the-art labs to a TV room, fitness center, and even a sauna. Meals on board are buffet style and include a mix of cuisines. Scientists and researchers study a range of subjects such as chemical oceanography and marine geology. Some even study zooplankton ecology. The ship can be at sea for 60 days, so anything goes wrong. There is a small hospital staffed with a trained doctor, as well as electrical engineers to keep the ship running smoothly. Sixty years ago, Britain one of 12 countries to preserve and protect Antarctica for peace and science. Today, 54 nations have signed the agreement. British Antarctic Survey is the UK's national Antarctic operator. It operates research stations, ships and aircraft in both polar regions. Its scientists study many areas including oceanography, biodiversity, climate change, and even space science. One of its most important discoveries was finding the hole in the ozone layer back in 1985. Today, they work in these and in more than 120 national and international collaborations. Together, these researchers advance our understanding of how the polar regions are responding to environmental change and what this means for all of us. Uh, we've got four Bergen engines, um, like the ones behind me, a nine-cylinder and a six-cylinder in each engine room. 
they, they should run at their optimum power at the various different speeds we need to operate the ship at. But the remit is wide-ranging across the ship from, from the engine room. If we go up into the accommodation, uh, we need to make sure the toilet are working and that there's, there's hot water for showers. It's all the small things that you don't think about that take up all the time in day-to-day -day operation. Someone's always asking you, can you just do this and can you, can you do that? So you're running around doing different things, which keeps it varied. The best bit of the job um, is getting the Antarctica and the uh, Arctic, just because um, on a normal ship, you're going from A to B, you, you, you see land occasionally and you, you hardly get off, but if we get to go and see penguin colonies, um, and, and the bases and, and help scientists with all their, their research. It, it just, it, we're part of the bigger picture, which is something you don't get on a normal commercial ship. The polar regions are home to many kinds of wildlife. Penguins live in colonies with populations larger than some cities. They are excellent swimmers and travel vast distances on foot or by tobogganing. This is where they slide over the ice on their bellies, propelled by their feet and wings. They keep warm by standing together in groups called huddles. Over time, the huddle shifts so no penguin is on the outside for too long. Luckily, polar bears live on the other side of the globe, so we don't have to worry about being eaten. Penguins live in Antarctica, while polar bears are only found in the Arctic. The Arctic gets its name from Arctos, the Greek word for bear. This is because the Great Bear and Little Bear constellations can only be seen in the north. In the past, you might have seen huskies helping explorers in Antarctica, but they were removed in 1994, so they didn't spread diseases to native creatures. So the David Attenborough as a new polar vessel for the UK really represents a massive investment but also a massive commitment to doing science in the polar regions. And that's really important because they're some of the fastest changing areas on Earth. We also need to understand the role of the polar regions and how it controls the climate and oceanography of the whole world. So having a ship that can go and get through some of the most difficult conditions in the world is really important in terms of doing good science that can help. Because of its size, it has the opportunity to bring in scientists from all around the world um, and form international collaborations that work on multidisciplinary sciences. We have a moon pool where when we are in the deep ice can deploy equipment through that hole that goes through the whole hull of the vessel and we can take samples in a way we haven't taken them before. Essentially you could study everything from microbes to whales. My colleagues who are geologists are going to use deep water coring devices. That's a big tube that goes down to the bottom of the sea and will sink into the mud and collect a sample of that mud in order. And those different layers are like the rings of a tree and they tell you different things about the oceanography and the climate at the time the mud was laid down at the bottom of the sea. Also, it gives scientists the ability to get to remote regions who might be working on land. The amount of autonomous vehicles we can use. So there's going to be ocean gliders, which go down to a depth of a thousand metres. Things that the glider measures is typically temperature and salinity of the water. It has interchangeable labs, so containerized labs that can plug into the ship. We have aquarium containers where we can keep animals alive from the deep sea for a long time and see what they do, how they act. Somewhere between 10 and 20% of the animals we collect on our expeditions are new to science, and that's just in places we know about. So the potential to go and look in deep sea where everything we find might be new to science, for me that's really important that we understand what we have now before it's too late. So my dad uh, was in the Royal Navy and when he would come home from sea he would have all these jobs that everything had broken while he'd been away. From a very, very young age I just start helping him, passing him the tools and eventually he taught me how to do it and now he just sits and watches me do it. <laughs>
I've got such a passion for how things work and, and I love taking things apart and seeing all the insides and, and seeing how it all fits together and that inspection and, and investigation on, on why things are not working correctly is just, it makes things so interesting. Although I'm working down below the, the waterline with no windows around, the navigation officers are on strict instructions to contact me if there's orca sightings or if we can see some seals playing and penguins on the rocks or icebergs and they'll phone down and let us know when something good's going on upstairs so we can go out and see it. The ship, the, the Sir David Attenborough, will take UK scientists and our international collaborators literally to the ends of the earth to try and understand what is happening in those regions. What's happening there is really critical for us all on this planet. It's really urgent that we take the ship to the polar regions now. The climate is changing faster than it ever has done before. Through this state-of-the-art new ship, the British Antarctic Survey will help to expand global knowledge of the polar oceans and the impact of climate change on this crucial region. This ship represents an opportunity to go to places that we've never been able to go to before. Places that are too extreme for our current capabilities. The very deepest parts of the ocean, the iciest parts of Antarctica, the most remote places that most ships couldn't get to and work in with the amount of fuel they carry. This really is a new way of working. We're now going to be able to go and look at animals in six and a half thousand metres of water. And we will go and do that on some of the first cruises and we'll go and make some measurements in those areas for the first time. The particular thing that I've always enjoyed is to go on and feel like you have a unified purpose to go out, explore what's in the ocean, working in these unique areas. Sir David Attenborough has a huge range of new facilities. It's so hard to pick just one cool or exciting example, but the first would maybe be the scientific moon pool, which is basically a hole in the ship that goes all the way down. And what that means is that we can deploy instruments even when you're sitting in the middle of icy seas or in sort of rough weather. The second thing is something called a giant piston corer. We can actually collect about 40 metres of mud and sand and the layers of sediment at the bottom of the ocean. Um, and that's about three or four times more than we could get with our existing equipment and research vessels. So there could be no more important function than those which are going to be dealt with by this remarkable ship at the cutting edge of science. No news to any of you that the world at the moment is facing great, great problems. And the most aware of that are the young people of today who will inherit this world. Great problems require great research and facts in order to solve them. That's what this astonishing ship will be here to do, to find out the facts, to find the science with which to deal with the problems that are facing the world today and will increasingly do so tomorrow. As many of you know, Camel Earth has an unrivaled history. Some of the greatest ships ever built have been launched from our slipways. Great British engineering 
is here in Birkenhead, and this polar research ship before you is the pride of Merseyside. We thank Sir David Attenborough for lending his name for lending his name to this iconic vessel which go together oh so well. We are of course here to celebrate a true British marvel, one that is strong, sturdy and incredibly well engineered, that deepens our understanding of the impact our behaviour has on the world around us and arms us with the facts to do something about it. An icon capable of feats not seen before and potentially never seen again. And no, I'm not talking about you, David. Those words wouldn't do you and your lifetime's work justice. Side. Through this state-of-the-art new ship, the British Antarctic Survey will help to expand global knowledge of the polar oceans and the impact of climate change on this crucial region. As Director of the British Antarctic Survey, this is an incredibly proud day for me and I would really like to thank everybody here in Camel Laird who've helped build this ship and to everyone in the British Antarctic Survey, engineers, project people, mariners and scientists who've helped design this ship. And we're incredibly excited and proud to take this ship to the ends of the earth to try and predict our future. It gives me great pleasure to name this ship Sir David Attenborough, and may God bless her and all those who sail in her. It is the greatest possible honour that this marvellous ship should carry my name and I wish good luck, good fortune to everyone who will sail and work with her. Thank you very much. So I work a 50% of a full-time contract in Brighton A&E, so I probably work three or four months of a year very closely packed together as my 50% contract and then the rest of the time I can come and do things like this. So it works really well, I keep up my skills um, by doing the A&E work, whereas if you did just this as a doctor you would de-skill over time. So we're quite well set up on the ship, so we have the surgery itself and then a ward beside that where if we had to have patients um, isolated or for other reasons nursed we could keep them in there so they've got some hospital beds. We have a, a resource facility. Um, we have an x-ray machine and digital developer, um, have the ability to do plaster casting, um, we can do basic This is a really exciting moment for us all. You know, this ship, the Sir David Attenborough, I've, I've seen it evolve from a pile of steel on the, on the floor of the shipyard into now, into this amazing state-of-the-art science ship that's going to allow us to do science that we've never done before. 
I mean, along with its massively important science impact, this ship is a, is a massive boost for us to fly the flag for UK PLC across the world. It's a huge boost for Merseyside and the northwest of England in general. It's not just the four or five hundred people directly employed in the yard. The offshoots into the supply chain all around the port will be massive. The actual project value will disseminate into the local area in a large way. And, and you know, the other thing is that the slip will allow us to use this as a platform for a much, hopefully, brighter export future of similar specialist ship around the world. To be able to get this opportunity to come work on this ship, but then also Camel Aids overall, Personally, this has been a massive opportunity for myself. This ship can go and change history and to research new stuff and find new stuff and everything about it should change some sort of history for the world. We're incredibly excited and proud to take this ship to the ends of the earth to try and predict our future. It is the greatest possible honour that this marvellous ship should carry my name and I wish good luck, good fortune to everyone who will sail and work with her. Thank you very much. Uh, my role is uh, science boating, so I mainly just drive the winches for putting the gear over for the scientists, um, getting what samples they need and this, that and the other. And this place is the winch room, which as you can see is a vast technical marvel if you want to call it that. There's seven winches in here. Um, all the sheaves are just uh, divert sheaves which take it to where it's got to be because we can go out the back there or through the middle there. And it just diverts the wire to the place it needs to be. Uh, when my dad started, he joined the shack, the old Shackleton, um, in the 60s. Um, went on to the Bransfield in the 70s. Um, yeah, and then I joined straight from school in 1986. Um, my son joined about four years ago. And yeah, so we're sort of a third generation of a, our family that have been working on these ships. started Camel Aid as an apprentice plater, came here to finish my apprenticeship. When I first started work I did feel like I was out of my depth because I never worked with structural ship drawings or anything like that. The support off supervisors and management have guided us in the right direction. Working on the Sir David Attenborough ship has made me realise that I'm happy with the career choice I've made. It's also given me the drive and inspiration to continue chasing my career and progress through the ranks. I think it's important that the ship is built locally in Britain because it's been used by the British Antarctic Survey. It's also good for the economy, it's provided a lot of jobs. My PhD is using gliders to look at mixing in the West Antarctic. Warm salty water at depth gets mixed upwards to the base of the ice shelves, causing the ice shelves to melt from below. So I'm hoping to further our, our understanding of some of these processes that are occurring. The processes that are happening around Antarctica will affect everyone. So to anyone who is interested in getting into this field, I would say try and keep a strong math and physics background and really just try and take any opportunities you can to get any field work or any research experience in the area that you're interested in. One of the best things about working in Birkenhead is that I get to go home to my little girl every night. When I come from my side to Camel Aids, this was me coming home. To be able to get this opportunity to come and work on this ship, but then also Camel Aids overall, this has been a massive opportunity for myself. Being a woman in our industry, yes, we are the minority, but at the same time, it's open for everyone. Whether it is being like a draftsman on a computer or whether it is being on production on the shop floor like myself, there is every opportunity to take it. It is a massive challenge every day, but everything is different and you're always learning. The fact that I could go on to something else, that's something different, that's a new challenge, that's just all I'd ever ask for. In 2014, the UK government announced £200 million in funding for one of the most advanced polar research vessels in the world. 
The new ship, owned by the Natural Environment Research Council, part of UK Research and Innovation, replaces the existing polar fleet of the RRS James Clark Ross and RRS Ernest Shackleton. Rolls-Royce worked closely with the scientific community to create its unique design. She's designed to break ice. She's also designed to have a large oceanic range of around 19,000 miles. And also, at 11 knot speed, she has to be virtually silent for the research that she actually does. The vessel is a 128 meter length, 24 meters beam, full load displacement of around 15,000 tons. So it's a fairly sizable ship. Construction began at Camel Laird in Birkenhead in 2016, with hundreds of people working on the project. So it was prefabricated blocks and then they come together when we were in the construction hall. The top half was separate to the bottom half and then once we launched down the slipway we then stuck the top half on basically. The ice strengthened 10,000 tonne hull was launched by her namesake Sir David Attenborough in July 2018. Our future and everybody's future will be affected by what people working on this ship, British scientists and others, will be discovering in years to come. The Royal Research Ship Sir David Attenborough will be operated by the British Antarctic Survey and carry up to 60 scientists from pole to pole. The uppermost housing is the conning tower, which gives us much better horizontal visibility when we're in the ice. The next one down is the observation deck. It's a great idea because it means that the people that we're carrying to Antarctica, they've got their own deck that has as good a view as we have on the bridge. Specialist facilities on board include a giant piston corer, moon pool, helideck, autonomous instruments and robotic technologies. So what we've got is a vessel that can take lots of people, can deploy instruments from various different points in different ways, can go into the ice, can take the moon pool that enables us to put equipment into the water even when we've got ice all surrounding the vessel. This ship represents an opportunity to go to places that we've never been able to go to before, places that are too extreme for our current capabilities. The very deepest parts of the ocean, the iciest parts of Antarctica, the most remote places that most ships couldn't get to and work in with the amount of fuel they carry. This really is a new way of working. It's no news to any of you that the world at the moment is facing great, great problems. And the most aware of that are the young people of today who will inherit this world. Great problems require great research and facts in order to solve them. That's what this astonishing ship will be here to do, to find out the facts, to find the science with which to deal with the problems that are facing the world today and will increasingly do so tomorrow. Our future and everybody's future will be affected by what people working on this ship, British scientists and others, will be discovering in years to come. And I thank everyone who has been involved in this wonderful enterprise and wish them huge success when this marvelous ship gets down there in the Antarctic, which we thought was so remote but we should realize now is absolutely crucial to the future of all of us. The 
RRS Sir David Attenborough is one of the world's most advanced polar research vessels. It is 129 meters long, 24 meters wide, holds 600 cubic meters of fuel, and has four main engines. Its generator is the size of a small bus. Designed to cope with extreme polar conditions, the strengthened hull and propellers can break ice up to one meter thick. The ship boasts state-of-the-art laboratories, so scientists can carry out groundbreaking research. They can deploy a range of remotely piloted scientific instruments and autonomous underwater vehicles, such as the famous Boaty McBoatface, to capture data from the ocean, the seabed and under the ice front. It's great living on a ship. Um, they're kind of like small little villages, really. Um, they've got everything you need to survive. They've got water purification, there's a canteen, the science labs, there's the computer rooms, there's the bridge, which you can go up and look out to see. Everything's heated, so that's all the outside decks. All the handrails are all heated as well to stop them freezing. You've got a sauna, you've got a nice coffee lounge, and it really is about the social interactions and it really is shipmates. There is that feeling of living and working together. So you need to find your way to work with everybody and appreciate everybody because you rely on each other. Some of the hardest things are being away from family and friends as we can be away for up to two and a half, three months at a time. Communications is incredible. When I first came you, you wrote a letter, now you just pick up the phone. The job itself can be taxing. Maybe we've had a lot of rough weather, so not a lot of sleep and people are a bit groggy. For me, the biggest challenge is uh, sleeping, especially in rough weather. <laughs> Ice breaking uh, is noisy. It can throw you out of bed. We do come complete You can calm down after a hard day of work. Most important is, of course, your own cabin. On the new Sir David Edinburgh, we will have cabins for two or a single person, and all of them will have windows to the outside, which will make a huge difference to be able to look out. I might turn around and see nothing one day, but the next day I'll see a dolphin or a sunfish or, or just something that, you know, actually is a pretty unique view. I was left outside at the ship to have a little rest and a breathe because we'd made a hole in the ice. I was screaming and shouting, is there anybody else to see this? And there wasn't. It just feels like something that is a real privilege. Welcome aboard. The ship can carry up to 90 people. Each person has their own comfortable cabin located away from the bow to reduce the effects of motion. The ship is a floating city and has everything you could need to live and work at sea, from state-of-the-art labs to a TV room, fitness center, and even a sauna. Meals on board are buffet style and include a mix of cuisines. Scientists and researchers study a range of subjects such as chemical oceanography and marine geology. Some even study zooplankton ecology. The ship can be at sea for 60 days, so crew must be prepared if anything goes wrong. There is a small hospital staffed with a trained doctor, as well as electrical engineers to keep the ship running smoothly. Sixty years ago, Britain was one of 12 countries that signed an international agreement to preserve and protect Antarctica for peace and science. Today, 54 nations have signed the agreement. 
British Antarctic Survey is the UK's national Antarctic operator. It operates research stations, ships and aircraft in both polar regions. Its scientists study many areas including oceanography, biodiversity, climate change and even space science. One of its most important discoveries was finding the hole in the ozone layer back in 1985. Today, they work with over 40 UK universities and in more than 120 national and international collaborations. Together, these researchers advance our understanding of how the polar regions are responding to environmental change and what this means for all of us. Uh, we've got four Bergen engines, um, like the ones behind. Nine cylinder and the six cylinder. In each room. They, they should run at their optimum power at the various different. We need to run the ship. The room is wide ranging across the ship from, from the engine room. If we go up into the accommodation, uh, we need to make sure the toilets are working and that there's, there's hot water for showers. It's all the small things that you don't think about that take up all the time in day to day operation. Someone's always asking you, can you just do this and can you, can you do that? So you're running around doing different things, which keeps it varied. The best bit of the job um, is getting the Antarctica and the uh, Arctic, just because um, on a normal ship, you're going from A to B, you, you, you see land occasionally and you, you hardly get off, but if we get to go and see penguin colonies um, and, and the bases and, and help scientists with all their, their research, In 2014, the UK government announced £200 million in funding for one of the most advanced polar research vessels in the world. The new ship, owned by the Natural Environment Research Council, part of UK Research and Innovation, replaces the existing polar fleet of the RRS James Clark Ross and RRS Ernest Shackleton. Rolls-Royce worked closely with the scientific community to create its unique design. She's designed to break ice. She's also designed to have a large oceanic range of around 19,000 miles. And also, at 11 knot speed, she has to be virtually silent for the research that she actually does. The vessel is a 128 meter length, 24 meters beam, full load displacement of around 15,000 tons. So it's a fairly sizable ship. Construction began at Camel Laird in Birkenhead in 2016, with hundreds of people working on the project. So it was prefabricated blocks and then they come together when we were in the construction hall. The top half was separate to the bottom half and then once we launched down the slipway we then stuck the top half on basically. The ice strengthened 10,000 tonne hull was launched by her namesake Sir David Attenborough in July 2018. Our future and everybody's future will be affected by what people working on this ship, British scientists and others, will be discovering in years to come. The Royal Research Ship Sir David Attenborough will be operated by the British Antarctic Survey and carry up to 60 scientists from pole to pole. The uppermost housing is the conning tower, which gives us much better horizontal visibility when we're in the ice. The next one down is the observation deck. It's a great idea because it means that the people that we're carrying to Antarctica, they've got their own deck that has as good a view as we have on the bridge. Specialist facilities on board include a giant piston corer, moon pool, helideck, autonomous instruments and robotic technologies. 
people. So what we've got is a vessel that can take lots of people, can deploy instruments from various different points in different ways, can go into the ice, can take the moon pool that enables us to put equipment into the water even when we've got ice all surrounding the vessel. This ship represents an opportunity to go to places that we've never been able to go to before, places that are too extreme for our current capabilities. The very deepest parts of the ocean, the iciest parts of Antarctica, the most remote places that most ships couldn't get to and work in with the amount of fuel they carry. This really is a new way of working. So I work a 50% of a full-time contract in Brighton A&E, so I probably work three or four months of a year very closely packed together as my 50% contract and then the rest of the time I can come and do things like this. So it works really well, I keep up my skills um, by doing the A&E work, whereas if you did just this as a doctor you would de-skill over time. So we're quite well set up on the ship, so we have the surgery itself and then a ward beside that where if we had to have patients um, isolated or for other reasons nursed we could keep them in there so they've got some hospital beds. We have a, a resource facility, um, we have an x-ray machine and digital developer, um, have the ability to do plaster casting, um, we can do basic um, sort of manipulations, sedations, that kind of thing. But, you know, I am only one person, so there is a limit to what you can do. Uh, my role is uh, science boating, so I mainly just drive the winches for putting the gear over for the scientists, um, getting what samples they need and this, that and the other. And this place is the winch room which as you can see is a vast technical marvel if you want to call it that. There's seven winches in here. Um, all the sheaves are just uh, diverter sheaves which take it to where it's got to be because we can go out the back there or through the middle there and it just diverts the wire to the place it needs to be. Uh, when my dad started he joined the shack, the old Shackleton um, in the 60s, um, went on to the Brownsfield in the 70s um, yeah, and then I joined straight from school in 1986. Um, my son joined about four years ago, and yeah, so we're sort of a third generation of a, our family that have been working on these ships. The ship, the, the Sir David Attenborough, will take UK scientists and our international collaborators literally to the ends of the earth to try and understand what is happening in those regions. What's happening there is really critical for us all on this planet. It's really urgent that we take the ship to the polar regions now. The climate is changing faster than it ever has done before. Through this state-of-the-art new ship, the British Antarctic Survey will help to expand global knowledge of the polar oceans and the impact of climate change on this crucial region. This ship represents an opportunity to go to places that we've never been able to go to before. Places that are too extreme, the very deepest parts of the ocean, the iciest parts of Antarctica, the most remote places most ships couldn't get to and work in with the amount of fuel they carry. This really is a new way of working. We're now going to be able to go and look at animals in six and a half thousand metres of water. A particular thing that I've always enjoyed is to go on and feel like you have a unified purpose to go out, explore what's in the ocean, working in these unique areas. David Attenborough has a huge range of new facilities. It's so hard to pick just one cool or exciting example, but the first would maybe be the scientific moon pool, which is basically a hole in the ship that goes all the way down. And what that means is that we can deploy instruments even when you're sitting in the middle of at the bottom of the ocean. Um, and that's about three or four times more than we could get with our existing 
equipment and research vessels. So there could be no more important function than those which are going to be dealt with by this remarkable ship at the cutting edge of science. So my dad uh, was in the Royal Navy and when he would come home from sea he would have all these jobs that everything had broken while he'd been away. From a very, very young age I just start helping him, passing him the tools and eventually he taught me how to do it and now he just sits and watches me do it. <laughs> I've got such a passion for how things work and, and I love taking things apart and seeing all the insides and, and seeing how it all fits together and that inspection and, and investigation on why things are not working correctly is just, it just makes things so interesting. Although I'm working down below the, the waterline with no windows around, the navigation officers are on strict instructions to contact me if there's orca sightings or if we can see some seals playing and penguins on the rocks or icebergs and they'll phone down and let us know when something good's going on upstairs so we can go out and see it. I started Camelard as an apprentice plater, came here to finish my apprenticeship. When I first started work, I did feel like I was out of my depth because I'd never worked with structural ship drawings or anything like that. The support of supervisors and management, they've guided us in the right direction. Working on the Sir David Attenborough ship has made me realise that I'm happy with the career choice I've made. It's also given me the drive and inspiration to continue chasing my career and progress through the ranks. I think it's important that the ship is built locally in Britain because it's been used by the British Antarctic Survey. It's also good for the economy, it's provided a lot of jobs. My PhD is using gliders to look at mixing in the West Antarctic. Warm salty water at depth gets mixed upwards to the base of the ice shelves causing the ice shelves to melt from below. So I'm hoping to further our, our understanding of some of these processes that are occurring. The processes that are happening around Antarctica will affect everyone. So to anyone who is interested in getting into this field, I would say try and keep a strong mass and physics background and really just try and take any opportunities you can to get any field work or any research experience in the area that you're interested in. One of the best things about working in Birkenhead is that I get to go home to my little girl every night. When I come from my site to Camelheads, this was me coming home. To be able to get this opportunity to come and work on this ship, but then also Camelheads overall, this has been a massive opportunity for myself. Being a woman in our industry, yes, we are the minority, but at the same time, it's open for everyone. Whether it is being like a draftsman on a computer or whether it is being on production on the shop floor like myself, there is every opportunity to take it. It is a massive challenge every day, but everything is different and you're always learning. The fact that I could go on to something else, that's something different, that's a new challenge, that's just all I'd ever ask for. It's great living on a ship. Um, they're kind of like small little villages, really. Um, they've got everything you need to survive. They've got water purification, there's a canteen, the science labs, there's the computer rooms, there's the bridge which you can go up and look out to see. Everything's heated, so that's all the outside decks, all the handrails are all heated as well to stop them freezing. You've got a sauna, you've got a nice coffee lounge, and it really is about the social interactions and it really is shipmates. There is that feeling of living and working together. So you need to find your way to work with everybody and appreciate everybody because you rely on each other. Some of the hardest things are being away from family and friends as we can be away for up to two and a half, three months at a time. Communications is incredible. When I first came you, you wrote a letter, now you just pick up the phone. The job itself can be taxing. Maybe we've had a lot of rough weather, so not a lot of sleep and people are a bit groggy. For me, the biggest challenge is uh, sleeping, especially in rough weather. <laughs> Ice breaking uh, is noisy, it can throw you out of bed. We do come complete with our own doctor's surgery and the ship always carries a doctor whilst in polar regions. You have your places where you can calm down after a hard day of work. Most important is, of course, your own cabin. On the new Sir David Edinburgh, we will have cabins for two or a single person. 
and all of them will have windows to the outside, which will make a huge difference to be able to look out. I might turn around and see nothing one day, but the next day I'll see a dolphin or a sunfish or, or just something that, you know, actually is a pretty unique view. I was left outside and a minke whale came up right next to the ship to have a little rest and a breathe because we'd made a hole in the ice. I was screaming and shouting, is there anybody else to see this? And there wasn't. It just feels like something that is a real privilege. The polar regions are home to many kinds of wildlife. Penguins live in colonies with populations larger than some cities. They are excellent swimmers and travel vast distances on foot or by tobogganing. This is where they slide over the ice on their bellies, propelled by their feet and wings. They keep warm by standing together in groups called huddles. Over time, the huddle shifts so no penguin is on the outside for too long. Luckily, polar bears live on the other side of the globe so we don't have to worry about being eaten. Penguins live in Antarctica, while polar bears are only found in the Arctic. The Arctic gets its name from Arctos, the Greek word for bear. This is because the Great Bear and Little Bear constellations can only be seen in the Northern Hemisphere. In the past, you might have seen huskies helping explorers in Antarctica, but they were removed in 1994, so they didn't spread diseases to native creatures. Uh, we've got four Bergen engines, um, like the ones behind me, a nine-cylinder and a six-cylinder in each engine room. They, they should run at their optimum power at the various different speeds we need to operate the ship at. But the, the remit is wide-ranging across the ship, from, from the engine room, if we go up into the accommodation, uh, we need to make sure the toilets are working and that there's, there's hot water for showers. It's all the small things that you don't think about that take up all the time in day-to-day -day operation. Someone's always asking you, can you just do this and can you, can you do that? So you're running around doing different things, which keeps it varied. The best bit of the job um, is getting the Antarctica and the uh, Arctic, just because um, on a normal ship, you're going from A to B, you, you, you see land occasionally and you, you hardly get off, but if we get to go and see penguin colonies um, and, and the bases and, and help scientists with all their, their research, it, it just it, we're part of the bigger picture, which is something you don't get on a normal commercial ship. Sixty years ago, Britain was one of 12 countries that signed an international agreement to preserve and protect Antarctica for peace and science. Today, 54 nations have signed the agreement. British Antarctic Survey is the UK's national Antarctic operator. It operates research stations, ships and aircraft in both polar regions. Its scientists study many areas including oceanography, biodiversity, climate change and even space science. One of its most important discoveries was finding the hole in the ozone layer back in 1985. Today, they work with over 40 UK universities and in more than 120 national and international collaborations. Together, these researchers advance our understanding of how the polar regions are responding to environmental change and what this means for all of us. Welcome aboard. The ship can carry up to 90 people. Each person has their own comfortable cabin located away from the bow to reduce the effects of motion. The ship is a floating city and has everything you could need to live and work at sea, from state-of-the-art labs to a TV room, fitness center and even a sauna. Meals on board are buffet style and include a mix of cuisines. Scientists and researchers study a range of subjects such as chemical oceanography and marine geology. Some even study zooplankton ecology. The ship can be at sea for 60 days, so crew must be prepared if anything goes wrong. There is a small hospital staffed with a trained doctor, as well as electrical engineers to keep the ship running smoothly.
So the David Attenborough as a new polar vessel for the UK really represents a massive investment, but also a massive commitment to doing science in the polar regions. And that's really important because they're some of the fastest changing areas on Earth. We also need to understand the role of the polar regions and how it controls the climates and oceanography of the whole world. So having a ship that can go and get through some of the most difficult conditions in the world is really important in terms of doing good science that can help humanity. Because of its size, it has the opportunity to bring in scientists from all around the world um, and form international collaborations that work on multidisciplinary sciences. We have a moon pool where, when we are in the deep ice, can deploy equipment through that hole that goes through the whole hull of the vessel. And we can take samples in a way we haven't taken them before. Essentially, you could study everything from microbes to whales. My colleagues who are geologists are going to use deep water coring devices. That's a big tube that goes down to the bottom of the sea and will sink into the mud and collect a sample of that mud in order. And those different layers are like the rings of a tree and they tell you different things about the oceanography and the climate at the time the mud was laid down at the bottom of the sea. Also, it gives scientists the ability to get to remote regions who might be working on land. One of the good things about the Sir David Attenborough is going to be the amount of autonomous vehicles we can use. So there's going to be ocean gliders, which go down to a depth of a thousand metres. Things that the glider measures is typically temperature and salinity of the water. It has interchangeable labs, so containerised labs that can plug into the ship. We have aquarium containers where we can keep animals alive from the deep sea. Hello and welcome to the RRS Sir David Attenborough, British Antarctic Survey's latest addition to their polar research fleet. I'm Alan and I'm going to take you on a tour of the ship today. We're going to explore all the many different incredible features that this ship has to offer to oceanography. But first of all, I think we need to meet our captain, Captain Will Watkins. Good morning, Captain Will. What an absolute pleasure and privilege to meet you. Here we are on the heli deck of the RRS Sir David Attenborough with this incredible view with the, the Cutty Sark here on the Thames. Uh, a very exciting day. Uh, how does it feel for you today? Uh, this feels incredibly exciting. It's, uh, it's been a long time coming. I've, uh, I've been working on this project since uh, we cut the first steel back in, back in 2016 and uh, I've been working towards this moment where she's ready to, to deploy to the Antarctic for the first time. And what an incredible ship. Uh, tell us about the features. Tell us what makes the Sir David Attenborough so very special. So this, this is a first of class research vessel. There's nothing else like it in the world. She's packed full of really good features to help us do better marine science uh, in the polar regions. We can take more scientists to sea for a longer period of time. We can um, do science in harsher weather conditions because we've got more power and more maneuverability. We've, uh, we've got a moon pool now so we can deploy scientific equipment through the middle of the ship uh, whilst there's ice all the way around the ship. All the equipment on board is designed to operate in temperatures down to minus 35. So um, she's just going to be a really capable platform for science in the polar regions. And uh, we cannot wait to put her through her paces uh, this coming season. And you've got a lot of crew on board. You've told us that there's more than ever. Can you tell us a little bit about their roles? What will they be doing on, on this voyage? Certainly. We've got um, around 30 marine crew. Uh, it's split into three departments, uh, deck, engine and catering. Um, so in the deck department you've got, uh, you've got the deck officers that, um, that drive the ship and keep the navigational watches and uh, drive the ship through the ice as well. And then you've got the deck crew who uh, do all the maintenance on deck and all the cargo work and deployment of all the scientific equipment. Um, you've got the engineering department who are, who are very busy at the moment doing all the final checks of their list, making sure they've got all the right spare parts and everything's uh, ready to deploy because we're going to be uh, away from help and any external assistance for, for quite some time. And then you've got the catering department that uh, keep all the accommodation clean and tidy and keep us all very well fed. I can see why there's so much to take. We've been seeing cranes lifting things onto the ship uh, for the last few days from, from the shore. Um, tell us about some of the things you need to take. What is, what's coming onto this vessel? So it's a wide variety of things, but um, there's all the cargo, which needs to go to the five Antarctic research stations that we have. Everything that they need, we need to take to them. 
Uh, there's all the spare parts for the ship, as I mentioned, and then there's all the consumables. We've got to take an enormous amount of food and supplies. Um, and when you put all that together, it's, um, it's a lot of stuff. And what about you? Is your suitcase packed? Yes, absolutely. The, uh, the ship is a second home for most of us. We spend half our lives here um, and we've been, uh, we've been ready for this for quite some time. Now, I've been told I'm OK to go and do a little tour and to show our viewers at home around the ship. Well, you should definitely have a look at, uh, at the moon pool um, in the science hangar. That's a, that's a really exciting feature. How uh, big is this pool? You, keep, you talk about this hole in the ship. Should we be worried? How big is this hole? Oh, it's, uh, it's fine. It's, uh, it's four meter by four meter square. And um, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's pretty sizable, but you should, uh, you should definitely have a look at that. Um, have a look at the science decks, um, have a look at the winch room and, uh, and towards the end, come and find me and I can uh, show you the bridge. We're okay to come on the bridge. That's fine. That sounds fabulous. I know you've got a very, very busy day. Everyone's very excited on board here. So I'm going to let you go and crack on and we'll catch you later. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Captain Will. Bye. Thank you. So it looks like we're ready to start our tour. We're going to let Captain Will crack on with his busy day on board the ship. And we're going to go and start this video tour so that you can explore the ship too. So we've been given permission from Captain Will to explore the ship, but we have been told that we need to put on the appropriate PPE if we're going to be exploring places like the engine room. So let's get that done and make our way down to the science deck. Wow, it really is more like a hotel than a, a science lab. It's incredible. The crew are so lucky. It's really beautiful on board. We can see the IT workshops and the data suites. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, this stairway takes us down to the science deck and the science hangar. And I think that's where we are now, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, this must be the science hangar that Captain Will was telling us about. I can see straight away we're in the right place. And look, guys, this must be, yes, this is our moon pool that Captain Will was telling us about. He said there was a hole four meters by four meters square right through the middle of the ship. And that is certainly not something I was expecting to see today. A ship with a great big hole in it. And that is certainly very impressive. And I think over here, this must be Sophie. Sophie, hi. hi. I'm Alan. Nice hi, to meet nice you. Nice to Hello. meet you. Hello. So, this is Sophie. She's one of the scientists on board and you're happy to tell us a little bit about what's happening here in the science hangar. Absolutely. Amazing. Yeah, so this is a science hangar. This is the kind of dry but on deck space where we can uh, play with all of the instruments uh, that are about to go over the side of the ship uh, or indeed through the moon pool. Great. So your instruments, that, let me get this right, the science equipment, the science instruments can go out of the, out of the ship that way or even straight down the middle. Yep, so uh, we like to be versatile. We have lots of different instruments uh, from kind of biology instruments collecting animals, nets, things like that, to um, CTDs that collect the physical properties or measure the physical properties of water, to other instruments that collect geological samples. And for a variety of reasons, they have uh, different capabilities that require different deployment places. So this ship is incredibly versatile. We might, for example, on a miserable day with poor weather, uh, where perhaps it's really, really cold, um, we would prefer to put an instrument through the moon pool because that, in fact, as you can see at the moment, we're enclosed, so we're not open to the environment. That means that things like our water bottles won't freeze up. Uh, and then also the moon pool being in the centre of the ship, it means that it's a very stable place. So even when the weather outside and the waves start to get a little bit large, uh, we can actually have a very safe and secure place inside the ship where we put instruments down through that moon pool. Wow, so there's a lot of data, there's a lot coming up from underneath the ship. Absolutely. And it can come in through this hatch going out over the side, it can come up through the moon pool. Are there any other, other ways that you gather data on, on, the, on the ship? Or? Absolutely, so uh, as well as the instruments that we put over the side, they're all connected with wires that are, that are transmitting yeah. the data back. Pretty much the, the bottom of the hull is lined with acoustic instruments. Uh, and these are the kind of underwater search instruments so that we are we are looking in the water column at the animals that are there we are looking at the seabed and how deep the sea is 
uh, and we have also instruments that even uh, ping sound that, that travels through the seabed so you start to examine what the seabed is made of so that's on the bottom um, but on top of that this this vessel we have one vessel we go to places and we go to far reaching far distant places um, and of course it's one vessel uh, we can only take it there for a limited amount of time um, and we obviously want to minimise our footprint in terms of carbon but we want to maximise our footprint in terms of collecting scientific data. So another thing that we do is to use this ship to take autonomous vehicles to the locations that we're studying. We leave, we deploy those vehicles from this ship and there are some examples in this, in this uh, science hangar. Whilst we will then complete our sampling by bringing lots of water on board, we will leave the autonomous vehicles with a variety of their sensors to stay for months sampling after we've left so that we can look at the knock-on impact of our point So these sample. that we can see behind us, these get left behind when you've gone? Yes. Can we take a closer look? Yeah, let's Excellent. go and have a look. Have a look. Okay, so these are the uh, autonomous vehicles, I guess you'd call them, that are going to be left behind when you come back home is that Abs right absolutely. so these will be left in the antarctic yeah so uh, these are designed to be deployed for somewhere between three and six months okay. uh, this one for example is a buoyancy glider the sea glider uh, and what it does is it actually undulates from the surface to a thousand meters back up again uh, and it has a variety you can put a variety of sensors on it so the standard ones for example again reminiscent of what was on the uh, CTD over there so you have something to measure temperature salinity the amount of algae that's in the water um, and essentially it uses its tail fin here to communicate uh, with satellites and send both its position and the data back to a scientist sitting very comfortably in their armchair or something like that. So they, they get that information, they decide perhaps that they want the vehicle to go somewhere else and they'll send it somewhere else. So they can actually program it from back at base as well as just receive data too? Exactly that, yeah. So they can Amazing. change their mind about where they want to go, you can, you can be proactive about sending it somewhere. Um, and, and one day someone goes back and retrieves it? That's the idea, absolutely. Um, yeah. And the one behind you that looks like, it looks not too dissimilar to a toy boat I had as a little boy. So <laughs> tell us a bit about this. So yeah, so like the one that I've just shown you is one that's in the water and it's going up and down. Uh, whereas this one, as you say, is, is more similar to a sailboat. Uh, and in fact, this one stays at the surface. But again, it's an autonomous ve vehicle. Uh, what's different for us about this one is we actually have um, an echo sounder uh, on on the bottom of it uh, that's pointing down and it's collecting information about what animals are living in the water column um, pretty much functions as a sailboat so we have a sail we have a rudder um, the component is that it, it, it actually uses a battery to control the rudder whereas the sails just reactive and it's getting all of its power from solar panels uh, so essentially this this instrument can stay out for as long as you want it to uh, and like the other one, it travels by waypoints, we can communicate with it, we can tell it where to go, we can change our mind, uh, and it transmits its data back to us. So all of these are really designed to get that spatial, uh, that space and that time coverage, um, and, and you know, to give us the background whilst we get the ship, to give us lots of water and lots of actual samples, yeah. uh, and the really high tech stuff that requires lots of battery power. And it knows it's solar panel, uh, solar powered as well. Yep, indeed. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's wind power for travel, and then the solar panel controls all the science payload and also the communication back with the land stations. Amazing. So this is identifying some of the animal life that's out there. And obviously we're collecting things over the edge and through the moon pool. So all of this data, and indeed some of the animals that you collect, what happens to them? What do we do with them? So uh, one of the things that's really impressive about this ship is the amount of laboratory space. Uh, and I, what I'll do is I'll take you into the wet laboratory, which is the kind of, the name says, it's <laughs> the place where you take all of the wet samples that you've collected with the instruments here and start to analyse them. Okay, great. So yeah, this is the wet lab. This is the first laboratory that your scientists will enter once they've got their sample from outside. Uh, traditionally, we bring it over to this this. A large stainless steel table where we can sort through the catches 
Uh, we have a couple of spaces here, and as you can see at the moment, we ha actually have a, a laboratory container that's appended onto here to give us expanded facilities, okay. so we can have an experimental aquarium or something like that that, that allows us to further investigate the animals. Um, so imagine that this table here would be surrounded by a group of scientists with different specialists who would be targeting specific animals that they're very interested in. So what could this look like if we're out at sea? <laughs> I want to know what, what I'm imagining on here. The likelihood is it would actually have lots of large trays on. So one big tray with the sample and the catching, uh, and then lots of small ones, and then lots of really, really eager scientists just all leaning over, kind of elbowing each other. Another reason why we made the table a lot bigger. Uh, and we all sort through the catch, and so the whole of that catch, even though it's it's what you you know what a what you wouldn't consider very large, it might be half a kilo, or a kilo or something like that. It's a bucket full essentially. Um, it would all be sorted down down to the smallest animal, uh, and counted and identified, and then those animals would be taken off into the various laboratories on the ship for further analysis. And what sort of animals would be in that catch? What would we be? So quite through? often in the Antarctic, the kind of key linchpin species that we will be looking at would be the copepods uh, and the Antarctic krill, so members of the zooplankton, which are these animal components um, that are microscopic or, or slightly larger, uh, and they're really the primary consumers of algae so they're they're a keystone species that's transferring the energy the carbon that we talked about earlier that's come into the phytoplankton uh, and they're repackaging it and quite potentially taking it down and removing it out of the surface waters so these are these are microscopic some of the things that these we're are microscopic at. yeah and so i've well, we've got a copepod over okay. here that right. uh, that will have come from one of those samples so again this is kind of microscope that we would have our our samples under and what you can see on the screen there uh, is a is a, an Antarctic copepod. What's always really fascinating about that is you can just about make out a, a darker patch in the middle. That's an oil sack, uh, and essentially that's its winter larder. So it's eaten oh, wow. really well over the spring and the summer, and it's stored fatty acids, stored these lipids in a sack, uh, and then it will use that over the winter the kind of the you know the scarce months like our our larders that we create from our seasonal produce and that's what's in here and so that's in that petri dish yeah. so that's smaller than a grain of a grain of rice in there it, and then we can see it on there. it is yeah that's great yeah okay and what's that ah so these are antarctic krill so these were the other key species that i was talking mm. about these uh, are about four to five centimeters long when they're adults so they're really big we, we rarely think of krill as being that big. Really successful animal in the Antarctic is about the equivalent to the human biomass of this one wow. species, bounded by the kind of polar fronts, the, the, the Antarctic fronts in the Southern Ocean. Um, it, just really fascinating. Again, they're, they're predominantly they feed on algae, so they're a very important kind of low food chain item. Uh, and then pretty much everything eats them. So if you think about all of your charismatic megafauna, as we like to call it, so your penguins, your seals, okay. your whales, um, you know, a lot of them, this is their key food species. Right. Uh, and so, it's, you know, as well as those animals, uh, there's a human fishery for them. We're, um, that has both a feed component uh, and what has really taken off recently is the pharmaceuticals component. Um, so there's a very keen desire uh, to understand how many of these organisms there are, where they are, what's going to be the impact of climate change on these organisms, and how is that going to affect the distribution of the predators, the successful recruitment of the predators into the future, as well as how many should be fished. Because mm, they're a key part of the food chain. Yeah. And us humans have decided we want a slice of the pie as well. Absolutely. Right. So, wow. Wow. So no shortage of those at the moment coming in onto the table, which nope. is good to hear about. <laughs> and then everything can, can be looked at in great detail here. And once you've gathered all that data, you know, we've got data coming in from so many places. I can see why it's a, a research vessel. There's so much data coming in. What happens to it all? Who has to do the number crunching? Where does it happen? So that's the thing, right? We want to consolidate all of that data together. Because whilst there's power in all those individual strands, there's even more power in actually combining them all and getting that kind of holistic overview mm. of what's going on in the ocean. Uh, so we have a server room, we store all the data together there. Uh, and I think you could meet 
Joe, uh, who will take you through some of that. He'll be, be um, up in the data suite. Uh, and he should also be able to show you some of the visualization tools that we have uh, that enables all of that data that's collected on the ship to be shown so that the scientists can kind of take that step back, look at it, and then decide what their next sample should be, where their location should be, what they want to do next. That certainly sounds like the next part of our journey, I think. Excellent. Great. Is it back out the way we came? Let's go back out that way. I'll let you lead the way. Go up to the data suite. Thank you. So, yep, if you come this way, we can go and have a chat with Joe. Uh, he's in our data suite and he'll show you some of the visualisation that we use uh, and where that data will be stored. Superb. Well, listen, thanks so much for showing us around the, the science hangar here. It's been fascinating and I'm sure everyone at home has enjoyed it too. Brilliant. Thanks a lot. Thank thanks, Sophie. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Wow, that's a uh, very heavy door indeed. This is one of the heavier doors on the boat. Wow. Okay, let's go on up and see if we can find Joseph. Hi, hi Joseph. Hi, I'm Alan. Um, Sophie said you were happy to talk to us a little bit about what goes on up here. Oh, definitely, yeah. Could Fabulous, be. thanks. Uh, it's nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. So, so, oh wow, okay. Across here is um, some of the data screens that we um, have in the data suite here. So, um, as you can see, some visual representations of the data that we collect. So, um, you've got like um, underwater cameras here and a webcam straight from the front of the ship. Wow. And um, yeah, it, all this data gets bumped into our little server room and then we can put it on any of the screens around the ship so people can view it where they need to. And how are the screens all over the ship, are they? We Yes, so yeah, even from your um, room, you can uh, tune into the data and you can just view it from there. So really, from the cabin, so people can be in their cabin just catching up on what's exactly. from webcams to temperature gauges and all sorts of things. Definitely, yeah. Amazing, okay, wow. So um, tell us a little bit about your, your time here on, on board. Have you been with BAS for long? Have you done many travels with them? So I've worked with BAS for about four years now. So and okay. uh, yeah, working as part of the IT team. So you must be very excited about the voyage in a couple of weeks time. Very excited, yes. It's a first time for me, so. First time? Yep. Heading south. Exactly. Oh, yes. great. So, are you are you joining the, the the crew in January? Are you? Yes. Yeah, I'll be joining in January, and then heading down, and then um, from there, I'll be going jumping off at one of the bases, and then um, doing some work there, and then flying home. Oh, amazing! Oh, that's so exciting. You're very, very lucky. We've been having a looking around, look around the the ship, and it looks like a, an amazing place to be working for the next uh, few months. Oh, it definitely is. Yeah. Great. Okay. So, thank you for your time. I know no you've worries. got lots to do. It's a very busy time, and yep. uh, I will I'll head off now. I think I'm going to head for the engine room. Yes. So if I can head out this way? Yep, just down there and you should lead you straight there. Wonderful. Well, thanks for, thanks for your time and lovely to meet you. No problem. All the best. Nice Good luck. Too. Thank you. Okay. Well, absolutely fascinating. I had no idea that there was so much data being collected and that it was being shared all over the ship and back to the UK too. So I'm going to head to the engine room, fingers crossed, I'm going to try and find it. If you'd like to try and find your way around the Sir David Attenborough, then you can follow the link on the screen now. And from the comfort of your own home, you can do some touring around and exploring of this amazing ship. Right, where's that engine room? Okay, so I think we might have got ourselves a little bit lost. It's obviously, it's obviously not this way. This says restricted, so... I don't think we can go in here, but, oh wow, <laughs> that is uh, very impressive. There's, uh, there's these huge reels of just cable that looks just like loads and loads of cable in there, but obviously that's not for us, but oh, maybe we get the camera. Th I'm Alan, and we just was looking through the window, but... I'm Simon, we're deck engineer. If you, would you like to c c come in? We'd love to come in, yes, yeah, okay. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. yeah. So if you're with me, it's fine. Okay, great, wow. So where are we now? This is in the scientific winch room. Okay. And this is where all the wires that operate the scientific experiments come from. Wow, okay. Can we have a look around? You certainly can, we'll walk you through yeah, this way. Yeah, sure, thank you. So yeah, we've got seven winches in here with all different types of wires. Okay. And, and explain everything else. Have you seen the moon pool? 
Yes, the, the, yes, down below the four meter by four meter moon pool through the middle of the boat. Well, that's the way that some of the wires go out. This side of it, just to your left, is where the wires go out to the moon pool. Oh, so when we saw the device that gets lowered into the moon pool, it's lowered through this. That's the cable it would be hanging on. That one cable there? Yeah. Wow, that's a very strong cable. And wow. we'll take it down to 6,000 meters. 6,000 meters off that? Wow, okay. Oh my word. <laughs> This is the heart, the heart of the operation. It really is. Oh my word. That so the aim, the aim is here, we can send, obviously we can send equipment down the moon pool. We've got two positions over the side that we can go over and we have the stern A-frame as well. And all those wires, depending on their function, can go to the, all the places they need to go. So these, these wires, these cables, wow. Are we safe? <laughs> That's the crane, the crane above it starting up. Oh, wow. So all of these wires and cables, are they just carrying um, items or are they? B both. both. Some of them are okay. carry nothing. I just ordinary steel cables, the ones over here and there. The one behind you and the one in the corner there, plus the one that's down, going down the moon pool, all carry data. So okay. there are a little communication down to, down to, the, down to it. Amazing. Wow. And what's the, you said, what's the, the deepest we can go? What's the longest cable? Well, the longest cable over there is the general purpose winch. It's 12 kilometers long. And that's designed with the purpose of being able to sample the sea life in the bottom of the South Sandwich Trench, which is about 7,000 meters deep. So that's a 12,000 meter roll of cable just on there. Yeah. Wow. And, and what sort of weight can the cable hold? I mean... Well, that one's rated at about 20 tons. It can hold 20 tons. Wow, because it must be heavy itself. Yes, and that's, the, and, that's, and that's part of the challenge you have. Yeah. For when we're taking, similarly for the same reason, when we're taking big mud samples, we have a, a bright yellow cable over here, which has a braking strain of 66 tonnes for our, our long mud sampler, or we call it Cora, which can take samples 30, 40 metres into the seabed. Yes. Wow, and that's a, a 66 tonne weight it can hold. It's, that's its braking strain. Wow. It's designed to safely hold about, about half of that, so 30 tonnes it would be able to pull out. So and that would be lots of London buses? Yes. Or about 60 cars? Yeah, very much Wow, so. that's amazing. And you said that's a rope, not one of these big metal cables? No, the idea is using ropes. They're neutrally buoyant, they, they, weigh, they weigh nothing in water, so all you're pulling out is the load from the seabed. Can we see this rope? Because yeah, I can't believe there's a rope that can hold 66 tons before it breaks. Oh, wow. Wow, it, it really is just a massive roll of rope, and this is some of the strongest rope or cable that's on board for, for, the vessel. For its size, yes, it's 28 millimeters diameter and weighs practically nothing in water, but yeah. So it's very, very light. It's less than three centimeters in diameter across and it could hold up to over 60 tonnes before it breaks. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, we, we te we've tested it to 35 tonnes. Have you? Yeah. And no damage, no problem? No damage, no problems. Wow. So tell us a little bit about your role on board. What's it going to be like for you when you're away at sea? It's, well, my job is to support the scientists, but effectively all the machinery outside the engine room is mine. The cranes, some of the boats, all the winches and that. And I work with the scientists to, as a sort of a person in the middle between the ship and the, and the scientists to ensure they get the data they want. So these scientists have spent maybe years of their career preparing something that's going to go over the side of a boat and it's your responsibility to get it back. That's the hope with the data. No pressure. Sometimes the, sometimes <laughs> the data is more valuable of than course. the instrument. Yeah, so if that's gone 17,000 meters down and has picked up a piece of mud that's going to give us a, an insight into something amazing in the world of oceanography. It's got to come back, right? Very much so. Wow, no pressure at no all. Pressure How at long all. have you been with Bass? Nearly 30 years. So you know what you're doing. Yeah. They're hopefully, in safe hands. Hopefully. <laughs> and I've been building the, building the ship from the, from the very bottom up. So do these scientists liaise with you? Do they talk to you about what they want to do and how they want it to go yes, they, over and down. The tools are fairly generic in some respects between different research ships, so they can do the different things around the world. But yes, very much so, they, they, wow. we, 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 communication is the key to everything. Absolutely. Is it just you or do you have a team? No, well, the, the engineering wise, there's a scientific bosun who works with the deck crew very closely to help them understand what we're trying to achieve, because obviously people come 
and obviously the, the chief officer and the captain and the chief engineer are all closely involved in the common goal of getting the job done. Fabulous. Are you looking forward to the maiden voyage? Uh, very much so. It's been a long time coming. Oh, you must be so excited. We're very jealous. <laughs> and this is such an amazing environment to, to have as your office. Very much so. <laughs> right, I'll let you lead the way out because okay. uh, you don't want to trip over anything. Yeah, just don't wash your feet. That's the only hazard with the place. Hence we, the reason we don't let people in so much. Were you a part of designing this space as well? I mean, when it was... I was involved very closely in with right, what we're doing, right. yes. Because obviously it's been very carefully put together. Everything is just slotted in the right place. Yeah, I, I, I talked with the scientists and what we tried to do, and there were some co compromises as always in what we did. Hence that wire there effectively replaces two wires on different right. So we had to come up with different ideas yeah. because of the way we've built the ship and where the equipment is. A lot of science research ships have the winches very low down. Right. Well, because of the cargo capacity on here, that's cargo down here, so we had to put the winches higher up, and so had challenges. And of course, with the moon pool, that's got to be from quite high up because that so, comes yeah. right through the middle of the, of the ship. Yeah. Amazing. Simon, thank you so much for your time and letting us in here. That's been incredible. Shall I head back this way? You can do, yeah. Thank you very much. Wow, what a fantastic opportunity to, to see this, this, uh, this part of the, the ship, this really, really crucial, important part that not only can send things over the edge of the ship to thousands of meters deep and get it all back again, but also carrying that ever important data along the way. That's been amazing. Um, right, let's carry on our journey. Okay, so that winch room was absolutely amazing. I never expected to see anything like that on board. Okay, so now we need to try and find the engine room. Now, I have been told it's along this way, so we'll have a look there. Oh, sorry. Are you, uh, are you looking for the engine room? We are actually, yeah, sorry, oh. we're just making a, a video. I'm Alan, we're making a video of the SDA. Hi, Alan, uh, my name's Carson. Hi. I'm the uh, scientific electronics engineer on board. Oh, wow, okay. So yeah, I nice can, to I meet can you. show you the engine room if you like. It's on the way to the cabin, I'll just head that way now. That would be absolutely amazing. So you, you're, you're living on board? I am living on board at the moment, yes. And you don't mind us having a little nosy in your cabin, is it? No, not at all, not at all. I've just got on, so it still looks nice and neat. <laughs> <laughs> Lead the way, that's yeah. a real bonus, thank you. Oh, so what's it like living on board? It is stunning. It's a really nice vessel to live and work on. It's more like a hotel in places. It is. It's even got its own gym. A, a gym on board? It's got its own gym <laughs> and it's got a sauna. A sauna too. Oh Absolutely. my word. All right, my cabin's just around here at the corner. Here we go. Oh wow, it's a... Uh, I'll be honest, it's a lot nicer than I expected. A lot of people don't expect that, I suppose, from what you see in the movies and that. But no, this is lovely. This is, this is the cabins we, we live and work in uh, for, for months at a time. So it, it's, it's quite nice to have the comforts available. Okay, so give us a tour. Do the, do the looking through the keyhole thing. Tell us what have we got on board here. Well, it's very comfortable, which is the main thing, because you do spend a lot of months and weeks away from your family. So it's nice to have the creature comforts. Nice little lounge suite to come in and read in in the evening, relax a bit after a long day's work. Um, both bunks, so we do share. So we typically have uh, two members of staff on board. So we have uh, someone on a day shift, maybe a night shift. We do tend to try and keep them on the same shift. I've, so got, to, I've got to ask, are you a top bunk man or a bottom bunk? Oh, bottom, absolutely bottom. <laughs> <laughs> and does, your, and does your, your roommate, does he snore? Occasionally, but we, we learn to live with that. <laughs> <laughs> and then you've got some storage as well? Yes, loads of storage, because again, right. as I say, you're coming on, you're living for, for months and weeks of time away from your family, so you bring a couple of books, maybe maybe a little project to do in the evening, a little bit of a puzzle to build. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we, a lot of people have some very interesting hobbies on board. Um, what, what, will you be, what will you be bringing on board? Oh, I, or what I, have you brought on board now, uh, I guess? A Rubik's Cube is, is, is a good fun, so you, you suck in more complicated Rubik's Cubes, you can play with that in the evening. So. Really? Not okay. quite exciting, but it's good fun. Okay, fair enough. And you've got a TV? We do have a TV. We get, actually, we do get live television. A uh, slight delay. We were able to watch the Football World Cup when it was being played. That was, that was great. So we actually had it streamed in the lounge, and that was, that was great. It was a really good evening. You've got it easy. You've got it really uh, easy. You and you say there's a gym and a sauna. There is a gym and a sauna. Well, actually, I can show you that if you like. Well, I'd love to see that. It's great. Thank Here you. Yeah, it's all these... And en suite as well, am I right? Uh, it is an en suite. Every, every cabin has its own toilet, so you don't have to share. There's no communal bathrooms uh, sort of in the corridors. It's wow. really comfy, really, really nice. Amazing. This is so much more salubrious than I ever imagined it would be. Well, it's, it really is important for the whole, the whole feeling. You've got to keep in mind that a lot of the crew are away for months at a time. You're spending half the year away from family and friends, and it's little creature comforts like this that actually keep people 
I suppose, sane to a sense, to keep yeah. happy. Um, and, and it is, it's important. Yeah, of course. Um, and of course, having the gym means people can keep their, their personal health and well-being. Very much so. Yeah. We actually did a couple of running challenges with our, uh, with our staff back in Cambridge. Sorry, it's just in here. Right. There we go, you ready? Yeah. Have a look at this. Oh, wow. It's a nice gym. It's absolutely lovely. So we have a little weight selection at the back. We do our running challenges on here, just waiting for the fans to keep you cool when you're doing it. Absolutely. Um, again, so it's got everything you need. Um, often we do things as team members in here, which is quite nice. You do team training, um, you know, and when you're away in the, in the science party, you'll come and train as a full group, which is really nice. Everything yeah, it's great. The ethos of staying fit, staying healthy, you know, healthy mind, healthy body. All of Absolutely. That. Brilliant. And through here, so once you're done, you've done your training, you want to relax afterwards, you can jump straight into a shower or straight into the sauna. There we go. Do we need to check if there's anyone in there? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, there we go. So I've sold it in through here. Oh, count this on. Look at this. Wow. How's that? I, do you know what? I'm going to even relax and take my hard hat off. Why not? This is great. So this is your sauna. You got the gym, you got the showers. It really is a little home from home, isn't it? It really is. That's it's, lovely. It's, these creature comforts that make a big difference to the guys on on board. I can imagine. You can can you imagine spending six hours on the deck, freezing, literally freezing wind, your fingers start to crack from the ice, right? Chilled to the bone, and you can wrap up and and, and head in here. Jump and you, in the and sauna. You, you've got it in your mind. You know it's coming. Like, you know as soon as coming. I finish this, I can get in the sauna. That's it. That's, That's it. Great. Head inside. Start warming up. You can come in here as a group, you can sit and chat about the day, chat about where you're going in the future, it's great. Really, really good fun. Awesome. And, I mean, is, is it always warm in here? Do you, do you have it running? I mean, it's not running now, obviously, but is it always running? No, no, no. We only run it when we need it. Okay, just when people need a little morale boost in just a cold the weather. Just the end of the day, a little, little I hour can imagine, stint. yeah. And, and I believe that the food's pretty good on board. The food is spectacular on really? board. It's very easy to put on a bit of weight. Even with this gym? Even with this yeah. gym. <laughs> so, so tell me what it's like. I mean, it's, um, I'm right in thinking that the, the galley is the kitchen. Galley is the kitchen. And the mess is the sort of eating, restaurant, That's cafe. the dining area, area yeah. Okay. We okay. go and dish up your food in the evening. So what sort of food's on the menu? Oh, everything. Everything from uh, seafood, as you'd expect. So some very good steaks, very good vegetarian options, which is really nice. Um, you know, we get, we get a full catered breakfast, a full catered lunch. Um, and then uh, again, dinner, dinner and evenings, a starter, a main, and a dessert. It's an all-inclusive cruise. It's an all-inclusive cruise. <laughs> and again, it's to actually make up with the energy you lose. So when you're down in the cold regions, you're working on a long day outside, you actually burn off a lot of energy. Ah, so, do you um, burn more energy in the cold than in the... You, you do indeed, oh, okay. you do indeed. It's, it's, it's physically demanding work, it's cold, your body's always moving, you're always shaking. Um, so yeah, no, the, the, having good food makes a big difference. Not, not just the health, but also the, the general ship's morale, which yeah. is great. You've got yeah. some good chefs. Unbelievable, top-notch chefs. As I say, every every time I've gone on, I've put on weight. <laughs> wow. Well, you need to get yourself back in that gym, and I'm going to head off to the engine room now. So that is down Absolutely, the yeah. way we were walking. Go down the way, um, turn the left, and down the stairs. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure to meet you, and nice I just wish you, you all the very best for your voyage it's, uh, ahead. Thank Take you care. Much. Thank you. Cheers. I'll leave you here in this corner. <laughs> Okay, so Carson said it was just down the stairs. Going to be in the right, yes, here we are. This is our engine room. And here we are, yes, no mistaking, this is the engine room. It smells different, it sounds different. It even feels different. It's a little bit warmer than, I, not as warm as I expected actually. I thought it'd be very hot down here, but it is certainly warmer. And I've been told that we are going to meet Simon who helped us out in the winch room. And I think he's going to be down here for us to show us around. Yes, Simon. Oh, hello again. Hi. Good to see you. How are you? Thank you. You found, uh, you found, we found us. You. We yeah. found you. So, we're in the engine room. Well, you have two. We have two engines in this side. And to make it nice and safe we have another engine room which is separate which has two engines in on the other side okay so is that in case one has a failure or, yeah, for extra or, speed or potentially or, or flood yeah okay but we, we are more like a power station where we have two di two diesel in each engine room one nine cylinder which is the low one behind you okay. and that goes all the way down that hole there and the small one 
It's the one behind me is the six cylinder. Right, and then that's mirrored on the other side Mirrored well. exactly on the other okay. side. And what they do is generate electricity. And we generate about 18 megawatts if we, if we, if we need to. Obviously, we just generate what we need yeah. to, be, to be as fuel efficient as possible. Yeah, yeah. And 18 megawatts, that's about, about 210 family cars. Wow. So, yeah. So we generate the electricity here. All the services thing come, come to the engines and do that. The generators are just these big boxes to the side here. And then we take the electricity further down the ship to power us away. Wow, amazing. So uh, do you ever use both engine rooms at the same time? Yes, yeah, so particularly if we're going to be, when we're working ice, we right. need all the power we can. Right, to generate more power to crush through the ice. Yeah. Fascinating. So. It's not as, it's not as um, warm as I thought it would be. Is that because this one's not running? I, I guess the other side is... And also, it's, it's October outside, and we're bringing fresh air in to keep us cool. So actually, we're bringing the outside air in, and that's quite a, got a bit of a nip to it today. Yeah, because my question was going to be really about conditions down here. I think I expected it to be like you see on, on films where everyone's really hot and sweaty and covered in oil and grime, and this is like really clean. It's really... Ambient temperature. It's yes, a, it's not what but when the, the engines run, and you'll feel that when we walk through next door to the switchboard rooms, right. the temperature goes goes up. And right. in the tropics, yes, this will be very very warm because obviously you're bringing blowing air in there, which is nice and cool today at probably what 10, 15 degrees. In the tropics, your cooling air is coming in at 35 degrees. Of course, of course. And how many people will be working down here in the engine room with you? We operate a couple of times. Obviously, it's not my usual place, but as we met before, the chief yeah. engineer asked me to bring you down here. Great. There's, a, there's not my chief engineer, who's over all the engineering on the ship, second engineer who's in charge of the engine room, right. and, and, she, and she looks after that. And then below her, she's got third engineers and fourth engineers, about two thirds and a fourth, and then obviously electrical two, two electrical officers as well. Amazing. Just to run all this. And there's further machinery rooms forward, just to provide all the services to the vessel. Wow. Now, Simon, you've obviously been an integral part of the of this this whole vessel. Have you, were you involved right from the start? Yes, I was lucky enough to be brought in one of three people to go into the shipyard very, very early on. Well, we had a chief engineer, a ca captain, I think Will, you met earlier. Yes, yes. He was the, one of the captains, well, he was, a, he was re recruited to be a captain, and then uh, I was brought in, majority of the science side, but because I'm a ship's engineer by training, getting involved with everything. So you were involved with where all of this was going to live and how it was all going to well, the function? Yeah, well, the designers, obviously the designers Amazing. shore side, they have a, have a remit to, we've designed a, a, a schedule of what they have to do and then they've put it all together. Wonderful. So I'm standing between an engine, another engine, two generators, and we've got all of that next door as well. And this all just sends that power through to the props which just turns the, yeah. turns the boat over and off yeah. we go. Wonderful, it sounds so simple. <laughs> right, should we carry on, have a little look around? Yes. yes, there's a million meters of cable in the ship making it all go. A million meters of cable? Yes. Wow, that's amazing. Well, as I was just saying, the electricity is generated by the engines, then comes to these panels here, and this is what governs and controls everything. And then from here, it goes through the ship to the propellants and the, the promoters that drive the propellants around. Great. Wow. And as we've come into here, this is the propulsion motor room. So these big blue boxes here are the electric motors that drive the propeller shaft. Wow. You see them joined in the middle? Yeah. So there's two in this room, and like the engine room, there is two next door. Okay. Because we have two propellers that's independently, so they're all separated out. Right. And is this built for speed or torque or power? What, what's the design being behind it? Obviously, a fuel efficiency is the, is the primary thing to make the best use of the vessel. But obviously, at the end of the day, we need power to get through ice when we need to do it. Yeah, so the, the, whole, the whole form and everything else was tank tested in a, a tank for model ice to work out how much power it was going through that would take to force its way through the ice. Because it's a bit different to previous vessels, isn't it? Its draft is, uh, isn't as deep. Is that right? It's a different... Quite, quite often for, for icebreakers, you put that much weight and power into them, they're quite deep. But where some of the places we go are relatively shallow. We're only about seven, just over seven metres. Right. And we need to be work on that. So there is a compromise in the whole form and making everything light 
and still being able to do every job we did. So we're not really built for zooming across the oceans, but no. certainly having the power when you hit a huge amount of ice to smash up. It certainly is, because when, when you hit the ice, obviously if you had a very sharp bow like warships or cruise ships, basically it's like an axe. Yeah. You ham it into a piece of wood, it gets stuck. This one's got quite a rounded bow with the aim that it rides up. And then I talk a bit like a spoon. You push the spoon down and use the weight of the, the surface area of the spoon and that just pushes the ice to the sides. Right. That's a new idea as well, isn't it? It's, it's, previously it's been about cutting through, but this is about sort of yeah. squashing down. Is that right? Since we've gone, gone, gone to working in them, Amundsen, very, some of the ships were very round, rounded holes, even back to Amundsen's time. But obviously we're taking it to the next, to the next stage, but all ice strengthened ships tend to have that sort of rounded form. Then. And yeah. I, I forget the gentleman, there was a, I think it was a Dutchman, right. or, or, a European who worked out trying to make tugs in a harbour in, over there, which iced up every winter, and therefore he generated this idea of using a rounded form to. And how thick? Stuff. How thick will some of the ice be that this has to power through? Well, the aim is we'll go th three knots or just over three miles an hour through a metre of ice of new, of first year ice. So it's the softer stuff, the newly formed, but we can well, it, push it out of the way. But also, it helps if it's, it's not very tightly packed, yeah. because sometimes you can be a hundred miles into the ice and the wind through weather changes and pushes you it pushes it and makes it much harder to go to go through there's no chance of the uh, the vessel getting trapped in the ice and frozen up is there i know that's happened in the past maybe. well hopefully yeah I, I was on a previous ship and we were temporarily because the weather's changed it nicked us and you get to the point where you're inside in the middle of the off the and tens of miles off the coast so you're in no danger yeah. it's just easiest to wait for the weather to change the ice to release because you just end up burning more fuel, yeah, yeah. getting away, just bashing your way through, not necessarily going very far, very fast. Well, having seen this uh, this lovely ship that we're aboard, I think there's worse places to be trapped. <laughs> so, um, listen, Simon, thanks once again for your time. So, what we've seen here today is that all of that power that we've seen generated in there comes through the control room, is driven through here, and then beyond there. We hit the props and the propeller drives the boat. That's the one. Wonderful. Great, we'll make our way back out. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Well, there we go. We found the engine room. Oh, it's quite warm. <laughs> we found the engine room and we have seen so much of this incredible vessel. Now remember, if you would like to do a tour all of your own of the SDA, you can go to the SDA virtual tour, the link's on the bottom of the screen now. Now before we go to our final stop, which is Captain Will on the bridge, I've been told that we can get ourselves a drink. So one of these doors takes me into a coffee shop. So I think I will just go and get a little refreshment. <laughs> all suffer from it. Yeah, absolutely. Hello. Oh, Hiya. Hello. How are you doing? We've yeah. just been in the engine room. Excellent. It was great. We found it. Thank you for your help. Last time I saw him, he was in the sauna. <laughs> <laughs> so I just had a, had a great time with Simon down in the engine room. He's been giving us the tour there. Everybody's been so fantastically welcoming. And we're just on our way to, to Captain Will up on the bridge. I saw, uh, when I saw Joseph before, he was telling me it was his uh, first time going south. And I wondered, has, is there a lot of crew who it's the first time for uh, to be going to the Antarctic? What about you guys? We've been going for a number of years now. My very first cruise was actually with Sophie about six years ago now. Oh, really? Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was quite a unique cruise. We got to go past some nice islands and see some penguins um, and collect some ice off of glaciers. So it was quite a unique cruise. It was quite a special one. So, oh, wonderful. Yeah, every cruise is special in its own right. Have you got a favourite oh, so far? I, I quite like the uh, seafloor trawling ones. Those are always quite nice. You find lots of interesting things. Like that. What about yourself? What's your favourite then? Um, I uh, I don't I wouldn't necessarily say I have a specific favourite. I, I think I usually have one favourite incident that happens on every trip. Uh, so I was blown away uh, a couple of years ago. Um, I went on a trip with some whale marine mammal observers who were out there studying the whales at the same time as we were measuring krill, uh, and um, they saw a blue whale. They called it down to the rest of us, uh, and to be honest, you know, we, we kind of ran to the decks to, to go and get that sighting. I've been to sea for 20 years, and so it took me 20 years 
uh, to see a blue whale for the first time. Amazing. And it was an awesome experience. A question I do have for you. This has obviously been a huge financial investment, not just in the ship itself, but or, or in the people and the crew, but th it's just been such a huge initiative over the last five years. Um, it's not an insignificant amount of money. Uh, what does it bring to the table? Why Why is it a, a good use of, uh, a good investment, a good use of the money? Um, I can't think of a better time that we can invest uh, in looking at in our environment and, and investigating it. You know, what we know is we're, we're, we, we have a changing environment. We, you know, we, I think we're pretty much in agreement now that change is occurring. Um, and in fact, we're, we're just leading into the, the COP event in Glasgow mm -hmm. now, which is where all the world leaders uh, will be sitting and discussing how we are going to mitigate for climate change. Um, and so what this vessel will bring to the table is the evidence mm -hmm. um, that shows what's going on currently, uh, as well as what's going on into the future as those mitigations are implemented, how they are working and how the, how the change is happening, how the climate is changing over time. Yeah, it's significant. I mean, it's, it's become clear, just so many people so passionate, so excited about it. And, you know, it's, it's clearly going to have a huge impact on oceanography and, and science and the climate. And I mean, the important thing to remember is what you see at the polar oceans is not just occurring at the polar oceans. It's okay. just, it's a really excellent place to actually identify things that are changing on a world level. So it gives us the information then that gives, can, can guide and uh, inform about the whole planet. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. Right, I've got one last question because Captain Will is expecting us. I don't want to be late for the captain. Um, but a, a question I do have that I love to ask, and I will be asking Captain Will as well. Young people, youngsters making career choices, making subject choices perhaps at school, what advice would you give to them if they were looking for a career that led them to a, an initiative or a project as, as impressive as this with Bass? I can start with myself. I'm a scientist. So when I was at school, I did my A-levels. I studied science uh, as, as the main topics. I then went through and did a degree uh, and finally followed by a PhD before um, joining Bass uh, and so coming there to, to study the oceans. Um, but Bass is so much more than that. And, and actually, in order to deliver the science that we do on this ship, we need so many more disciplines than just the scientists. So we need the engineers, uh, not just to help us with our scientific instruments, but to make the ship go. Uh, we need the deck crew, um, the people who are on watch on the bridge, who are driving the ship, the people who are on the deck, who are helping us put stuff over the, over the side, the chefs in the galley to make the food for us, the plumbers. Um, so, you know, there are, there are a multitude of trades that you can do and so whether or not you do those in school or through an apprenticeship um, there are many skills that can be applied on this vessel as well as on the stations that, that Bass operates. And I think okay. that's the key message everybody has a role to play in, uh, in saving the environment saving the planet so it doesn't matter what you do as long as you're working towards that. Absolutely well I think that's a, a great point to finish on that not everyone can do everything but everyone can do something and then we've got an insight into what you guys are doing and that's really powerful so thanks so much for your time i am going to head off to the bridge now so i'll leave you to enjoy your coffee it's probably cold now apologies for taking up <laughs> even more of your time but thanks very much i'll see you later Thank you very much. thanks bye bye Captain Will, hello. Hello, welcome to the bridge. Thank you, um, and what an amazing tour we've had. The ship is incredible. We've met the lovely crew. We've seen the moon pool, as you suggested. We've been down to the engine room. We've been very welcomed and very well looked after. So thank you so much. And, and here we are on, on the bridge. Tell us more. Wow, it's, a, it's, it's more like the Starship Enterprise. Tell us what we're looking at here today. OK, well, uh, there are an awful lot of buttons and dials up here and uh, it's quite a complicated space but the most important bit is where I'm standing now. From standing here this is where you've got all the controls for the engines, the thrusters and the steering. So this is the main conning position that we can drive the ship from. These are the controls for the main engine here, these are the controls for the steering and all this is the controls for the thrusters. So there's nothing in terms of driving the ship that you can't do from standing right here. There are many other safety systems up here uh, with lots of panels and we've spent a lot of time training going through all the systems on the bridge one by one making sure that we all know what all the buttons do. And what's on all the screens that we can see above? There's charts and graphs and dials and all sorts of things. 
So a lot of the um, technical scientific equipment that we have on board um, can be repeated up here so we can see what the scientists are looking at as well. Um, so it's a mixture of that as well as just normal navigational information. Fabulous. Now, you've been involved in, in this project right from the get-go. You've been involved from, what is it, five years now you've been with the, this particular project and you've been with BAS for even longer. That's right, yes. I've been with uh, the British Antarctic Survey since 2008 and uh, as soon as, I, as soon as I joined, I was, I was hooked and loved it and uh, never looked back. But how's it been being part of a project that you know, you're going to be the captain of a ship that hasn't even been built yet? I mean, how did that feel? That felt very weird, uh, particularly at the very beginning of the project when uh, I was involved um, and it was all just drawings and there was nothing tangible at all, not one bit of steel that you could have said that's part of the ship. And that felt very odd, being um, so involved in something which didn't exist. <laughs> Uh, but as it came to life, it just got more and more exciting and uh, it's really satisfying to be able to see some of the features on the ship now, which I was able to have an input to at that design stage when there was nothing. And I said, right, you know, we want a door here and we want, uh, we want the ability to tie a tire rope on there and that sort of thing. And they'll be able to see that in use now is, is really great for me. So the launch of the actual hull was in 2018, the naming was in 2019, and here we are with the maiden voyage in 2021. Now I know the ship's been well, It's been an exceptionally busy period. Uh, as I'm sure you can appreciate, um, nobody would want to send the ship off to the Antarctic for the first time without some thorough testing in home waters before we go. So we've been uh, going through all the safety systems on board and testing endurance, testing things like fresh water making so we can still make water when we're at sea for long periods of time and uh, making sure the ship can handle well in rough weather um, as well as just testing some of like making sure if we've got lots of people on board there's enough hot water so we can all have a shower. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a real variety of things we've had to test but we're now in a position where we are uh, ready to go. That's amazing. Clearly a lot of kit and equipment to, to get used to handling. And I, I was curious, uh, just in your time with BAS and in your career, what sort of technological and innovative developments have you seen that have changed the way that you and your colleagues and crew and scientists can do oceanography? Well, technology moves so fast. I've noticed it not even in my career with BAS, but even in the time of the build of this ship since the beginning to the end, from when we started specifying equipment, when you actually go come to have it fitted, you can find it's out of date. So we actually had to um, go back to some of the suppliers and say, well, actually, we don't want that. We want your latest model because from when we specified it to when we're actually having it is uh, a few years in between. But um, some of the interesting things we got on this ship, uh, which are really cutting edge, is we got this ice load monitoring system. So now when we um, hit the ice with the ship, when we're ice breaking, uh, we've got strain gauges in the hull uh, to allow us to see how far we're pushing the structure and uh, that is a really, really useful tool for us when we're ice breaking. So Captain Will, you've travelled all over the big seas. Tell us, has there ever been a moment where you've thought, oh, this is a little bit too scary for my liking? Well, we, we have been in some enormous seas down in the Southern Ocean going to and from the Antarctic. Uh, I can't say there's ever been times when, when it's been scary because we've always been in a ship that's well designed and uh, is capable of dealing with it. And uh, once you get down um, into the Antarctic, you've normally got a lot of ice around you. So that kills all the, the swell and it becomes uh, much calmer. So um, yeah, we try and avoid the scary stuff if we can. That sounds like a good idea. A <laughs> uh, uh, quick question, are you superstitious at all? Is there anything about sailing or traveling that you think you, know, you, you have a superstition about? Uh, no, there's nothing I take for good luck. And I wouldn't say I'm very superstitious, but I wouldn't set off on our maiden voyage to the Antarctic on a Friday the 13th. I'm sure like all of the crew, you'll miss your friends and family terribly while you're away, but what one thing will you miss that you can't take with you from home? Well, I think the, uh, the thing I always do when I get home is, uh, is have some fresh milk. That's the one thing I miss when, uh, when I'm away for a long period of time. We have fresh milk that's frozen on board, but it's, it's never quite the same. There's one, one for the cornflakes in the morning yeah. and the cup of tea. I, I can understand that. Um, I was wondering, a lot of the people who are watching this will be youngsters, young people at school, may, maybe making uh, subject choices in their secondary schools. What advice would you give to a, a, a youngster who is perhaps wanting to be the, the next generation of, of crew or scientists or perhaps even a captain of a vessel like this? 
uh, the main thing I would say is uh, to uh, to start a, any career in the Poda region, start it early. Um, I left school at 16 and went uh, went straight to sea and did a Merchant Navy cadetship, which I'd highly recommend. But there are there are many other routes to uh, to working in the Antarctic. But uh, my advice would be just to uh, to get on with it straight away. My last question for you. Um, Ernest Shackleton famously overcame extremely challenging circumstances in the Antarctic and his crew of course benefited from his, uh, his resilience and, and, and his leadership skills. I wonder what your approach is to, to leading a crew of this size and, and being responsible for, for such an important voyage. So whilst the, uh, the ultimate responsibility for this, uh, this massive ship does rest with me, I'm very fortunate that I've got a, a great team around me uh, which make the job very easy and they share that responsibility for a day-to-day -day running. Uh, everyone's got their own job scope, and um, as long as it's all going well, the job is actually fairly easy. It only becomes difficult from a leadership point of view when uh, things start going a bit wrong, but I'm pleased to say that uh, that hasn't happened yet. Well, Captain Will, thank you so much for your time today, for telling us all about not just the bridge, but so much about this, this maiden voyage that you have ahead of you. We wish you all the very, very best of luck. And I'm sure everybody at home and around the world who's been watching has thoroughly enjoyed having an insight into this incredible ship and meeting some of the crew. So thank you so much for your time and we wish you all the best. It's a pleasure. We're all very proud to, uh, to be able to show you our ship and thanks for coming. Thank you, Captain Will. What an amazing insight to this ship, the RRS Sir David Attenborough. I've had an amazing time here on board. I've met some great people, the lovely crew who've made us so welcome, and of course, seeing some of these incredible features on this ship. I hope you've enjoyed it too, following along from wherever you are in the world. I'm sure, like me, you wish everybody who's been a part of this project the very best of luck for their maiden voyage. Thank you for watching. In 2014, the UK government announced £200 million in funding for one of the most advanced polar research vessels in the world. The new ship, owned by the Natural Environment Research Council, part of UK Research and Innovation, replaces the existing polar fleet of the RRS James Clark Ross and RRS Ernest Shackleton. Rolls-Royce worked closely with the scientific community to create its unique design. She's designed to break ice. She's also designed to have a large oceanic range of around 19,000 miles. And also, at 11 knot speed, she has to be virtually silent for the research that she actually does. The vessel is a 128 meter length, 24 meters beam, full load displacement of around 15,000 tons. So it's a fairly sizable ship. Construction began at Camel Laird in Birkenhead in 2016, with hundreds of people working on the project. So it was prefabricated blocks and then they come together when we were in the construction hall. The top half was separate to the bottom half and then once we launched down the slipway we then stuck the top half on basically. The ice strengthened 10,000 tonne hull was launched by her namesake Sir David Attenborough in July 2018. Our future and everybody's future will be affected by what people working on this ship, British scientists and others, will be discovering in years to come. The Royal Research Ship Sir David Attenborough will be operated by the British Antarctic Survey and carry up to 60 scientists from pole to pole. The uppermost housing is the conning tower, which gives us much better horizontal visibility when we're in the ice. The next one down is the observation deck. It's a great idea because it means that the people that we're carrying to Antarctica, they've got their own deck that has as good a view as we have on the bridge. Specialist facilities on board include a giant piston corer, moon pool, heli deck, autonomous instruments and robotic technologies. So what we've got is a vessel that can take lots of people, can deploy instruments from various different 
points in different ways, can go into the ice, can take the moon pool that enables us to put equipment into the water, even when we've got ice all surrounding the vessel. This ship represents an opportunity to go to places that we've never been able to go to before, places that are too extreme for our current capabilities. The very deepest parts of the ocean, the iciest parts of Antarctica, the most remote places that most ships couldn't get to and work in with the amount of fuel they carry. This really is So I work a 50% of a full-time contract in Brighton A&E, so I probably work three or four months of a year very closely packed together as my 50% contract and then the rest of the time I can come and do things like this. So it works really well, I keep up my skills um, by doing the A&E work, whereas if you did just this as a doctor you would de-skill over time. So we're quite well set up on the ship, so we have the surgery itself and then a ward beside that where if we had to have patients um, isolated or for other reasons nursed we could keep them in there so they've got some hospital beds. We have a, a resus facility, um, we have an x-ray machine and digital developer, um, I have the ability to do plaster casting, um, we can do basic um, sort of manipulations, sedations, that kind of thing. But, you know, I am only one person, so there is a limit to what you can do. Uh, my role is uh, science boating, so I mainly just drive the winches for the gear over for the scientists, um, getting what samples they need and this, that and the other. And this place is the winch room, which as you can see is a vast technical marvel, if you want to call it that. There's seven winches in here. Um, all the sheaves are just uh, divert sheaves, which take it to where it's got to be, because we can go out the back there or through the middle there. And it just diverts the wire to the place it needs to be. Uh, well, my dad started, he joined the shack, the old Shackleton, um, in the 60s, um, went on to the Bransfield in the 70s, um, yeah, and then I joined straight from school in 19. Um, my son joined about four years ago, and yeah, so we're sort of a third generation of a, our family that have been working on these ships. The ship, the, the Sir David Attenborough, will take UK scientists and our international collaborators literally to the ends of the earth to try and understand what is happening in those regions. What's happening there is really critical for us all on this planet. It's really urgent that we take the ship to the polar regions now. The climate is changing faster than it ever has done before. Through this state-of-the-art new ship, the British Antarctic Survey will help to expand global knowledge of the polar oceans and the impact of climate change on this crucial region. This ship represents an opportunity to go to places that we've never been able to go to before, places that are too extreme for our current capabilities. The very deepest parts of the ocean, the iciest parts of Antarctica, the most remote places that most ships couldn't get to and work in with the amount of fuel they carry. This really is a new way of working. We're now going to be able to go and look at animals in six and a half thousand metres of water. And we will go and do that on some of the first cruises and we'll go and make some measurements in those areas for the first time. The particular thing that I've always enjoyed is to go on and feel like you have a unified purpose to go out, explore what's in the ocean, working in these unique areas. Sir David Attenborough has a huge range of new facilities. It's so hard to pick just one cool or exciting example, but the first would maybe be the scientific moon pool, which is basically a hole in the ship that goes all the way down. And what that means is that we can deploy instruments even when you're sitting in the middle of icy seas or in sort of rough weather. The second thing is something called a giant piston corer. 
we can actually collect about 40 metres of mud and sand and the layers of sediment at the bottom of the ocean. Um, and that's about three or four times more than we could get with our existing equipment and research vessels. So there could be no more important function than those which are going to be dealt with by this remarkable ship at the cutting edge of science. So my dad uh, was in the Royal Navy and when he would come home from sea he would have all these jobs that everything had broken while he'd been away. From a very, very young age I just start helping him, passing him the tools and eventually he taught me how to do it and now he just sits and watches me do it. <laughs> I've got such a passion for how things work and, and I love taking things apart and seeing all the insides and, and seeing how it all fits together and that inspection and, and investigation on why things are not working correctly is just, it just makes things so interesting. Although I'm working down below the, the waterline with no windows around, the navigation officers are on strict instructions to contact me if there's orca sightings or if we can see some seals playing and penguins on the rocks or icebergs and they'll phone down and let us know when something good's going on upstairs so we can go out and see it. I started at Hamlet as an apprentice plater, came here to finish my apprenticeship. When I first started work, I did feel like I was out of my depth because I never worked with structural ship drawings or anything like that. The support of supervisors and management, they've guided us in the right direction. Working on the Sir David Attenborough ship has made me realise that I'm happy with the career choice I've made. It's also given me the drive and inspiration to continue chasing my career and progress through the ranks. I think it's important that the ship is built locally in Britain because it's been used by the British Antarctic Survey. It's also good for the economy, it's provided a lot of jobs. My PhD is using gliders to look at mixing in the West Antarctic. Warm salty water at depth gets mixed upwards to the base of the ice shelves causing the ice shelves to melt from below. So I'm hoping to further our, our understanding of some of these processes that are occurring. The processes that are happening around Antarctica will affect everyone. So to anyone who is interested in getting into this field, I would say try and keep a strong massive physics background and really just try and take any opportunities you can to get any field work or any research experience in the area that you're interested in. One of the best things about working in Birkenhead is that I get to go home to my little girl every night. When I come from my site to Camelhead, this was me coming home. To be able to get this opportunity to come and work on this ship, but then also Camelhead overall, this has been a massive opportunity for myself. Being a woman in our industry, yes, we are the minority, but at the same time, it's open. and you're always learning. The fact that I could go on to something else, that's something different, that's a new challenge, that's just all I'd ever ask for. It's great living on a ship. Um, they're kind of like small little villages, really. Um, they've got everything you need to survive. They've got water purification, there's a canteen, the science labs, there's the computer rooms, there's the bridge which you can go up and look out to see. Everything's heated, so that's all the outside decks. All the handrails are all heated as well to stop them freezing. You've got a sauna, you've got a nice coffee lounge, and it really is about the social interactions and it really is shipmates. There is that feeling of living and working together. So you need to find your way to work with everybody and appreciate everybody because you... Some of the hardest things are being away from family and friends as we can be away for up to two and a half, three months at a time. Communications is incredible. When I first came you, you wrote a letter, now you just pick up the phone. The job itself can be taxing. Maybe we've had a lot of rough weather, so not a lot of sleep and people are a bit groggy. For me, the biggest challenge is uh, sleeping, especially in rough weather. <laughs> Ice breaking uh, is noisy, it can throw you out of bed. We do come complete with our own doctor's surgery and the ship always carries a doctor whilst in polar regions. You have your places where you can calm down after hard.
own cabin. On the new Sir David Edinburgh, we will have cabins for two or a single person, and all of them will have windows to the outside, which will make a huge difference to be able to look out. I might turn around and see nothing one day, but the next day I'll see a dolphin or a sunfish or, or just something that, you know, actually is a pretty unique view. I was left outside and a minky whale came up right next to the ship because we'd made a hole in the ice. I was screaming and shouting, is there anybody else to see this? And there wasn't. It just feels like something that is a real privilege. regions are home to many kinds of wildlife. Penguins live in colonies with populations larger than some cities. They are excellent swimmers and travel vast distances on foot or by tobogganing. This is where they slide over the ice on their bellies, propelled by their feet and wings. They keep warm by standing together in groups called huddles. Over time, the huddle shifts so no penguin is on the outside for too long. Sorry about being eaten. Penguins live in Antarctica, while polar bears are only found in the Arctic. The Arctic gets its name from Arctos, the Greek word for bear. This is because the great bear and little bear constellations can only be seen in the northern hemisphere. In the past, you might have seen husky helping explorers in Antarctica, but they were removed in 1994, so they didn't spread diseases to native creatures. We've got four Berg engines, um, like the ones behind me, a nine-cylinder and a six-cylinder in each engine room. They, they should run at their optimum power at the various different speeds we need to operate the ship at. But the, the remit is wide-ranging across the ship, from, from the engine room, if we go up into the accommodation, uh, we need to make sure the toilets are working and that there's, there's hot water for showers. It's all the small things that you don't think about that take up all the time. In the day. varied. The best bit of the job um, is getting the Antarctica and the uh, Arctic just because um, on a normal ship you're going from A to B, you, you, you see land occasionally and you, you hardly get off but if we get to go and see penguin colonies um, and, and the bases and, and help scientists with all their, their research, it, it just it, we're part of the bigger picture which is something you don't get on a normal commercial ship. Sixty years ago, Britain was one of 12 countries that signed an international agreement to preserve and protect Antarctica for peace and science. Today, 54 nations have signed the agreement. British Antarctic Survey is the UK's national Antarctic operator. It operates research stations, ships, areas including oceanography, biodiversity, climate change, and even space science. One of its most important discoveries was finding the hole in the ozone layer back in 1985. Today, they work with over 40 UK universities and in more than 120 national and international collaborations. Together, these researchers advance our understanding of how the polar regions are responding to environmental change and what this means for all. Welcome aboard. The ship can carry up to 90 people. Each person has their own comfortable cabin located away from the bow to reduce the effects of motion. The ship is a floating city and has everything you could need to live and work at sea, from state-of-the-art labs to a TV room, fitness center, and even a sauna. Meals on board are buffet style and include a mix of cuisines. Scientists and researchers study a range of subjects such as chemical oceanography and marine geology. Some even study zooplankton ecology. The ship can be at sea for 60 days, so crew must be prepared if anything goes wrong. There is a small hospital staffed with a trained doctor, as well as electrical engineers to keep the ship running smoothly.
So the David Attenborough as a new polar vessel for the UK really represents a massive investment, but also a massive commitment to doing science in the polar regions. And that's really important because they're some of the fastest changing areas on Earth. We also need to understand the role of the polar regions and how it controls the climate and oceanography of the whole world. So having a ship that can go and get through some of the most difficult conditions in the world is really important in terms of doing good science that can help humanity. Because of its size, it has the opportunity to bring in scientists from all around the world um, and form international collaborations that work on multidisciplinary sciences. We have a moon pool where, when we are in the deep ice, can deploy equipment through that hole that goes through the whole hull of the vessel. And we can take samples in a way we haven't taken them before. Essentially you could study everything from microbes to whales. My colleagues who are geologists are going to use deep water coring devices. That's a big tube that goes down to the bottom of the sea and will sink into the mud and collect a sample of that mud in order. And those different layers are like the rings of a tree and they tell you different things about the oceanography and the climate at the time the mud was laid down at the bottom of the sea. Also, it gives scientists the ability to get to remote regions who might be working on land. One of the good things about the Sir David Attenborough is going to be the amount of autonomous vehicles we can use. So there's going to be ocean gliders, which go down to a depth of a thousand metres. Things that the glider measures is typically temperature and salinity of the water. It has interchangeable labs, so containerised labs that can plug into the ship. We have aquarium containers where we can keep animals alive from the deep sea for a long time and see what they do, how they act. Somewhere between 10 and 20% of the animals we collect on our expeditions are new to science, and that's just from places we know about. So the potential to go and look in the deep sea where everything we find might be new to science, for me that's really important that we understand what we have now before it's too late. It's no news to any of you that the world at the moment is facing great, great problems. And the most aware of that are the young people of today who will inherit this world. Great problems require great research and facts in order to solve them. That's what this astonishing ship will be here to do. To find out the facts. To find the science with which to deal with the problems that are facing the world today and will increasingly do so tomorrow. Our future and everybody's future will be affected by what people working on this ship, British scientists and others, will be discovering in years to come. And I thank everyone who has been involved in this wonderful enterprise and wish them huge success when this marvelous ship gets down there in the Antarctic, which we thought was so remote but we should realize now is absolutely crucial to the future of all of us.
It's no news to any of you that the world at the moment is facing great, great problems. And the most aware of that are the young people of today who will inherit this world. Great problems require great research and facts in order to solve them. That's what this astonishing ship will be here to do, to find out the facts, to find the science with which to deal with the problems that are facing the world today lending his name to this iconic vessel which go together oh so well. We are of course here to celebrate a true British marvel, one that is strong, sturdy and incredibly well engineered, that deepens our understanding of the impact our behaviour has on the world around us and arms us with the facts to do something about it. An icon capable of feats not seen before and potentially never seen again. And no, I'm not talking about you, David. Those words wouldn't do you and your lifetime's work justice. The RRS Sir David Attenborough is a testament to the cutting edge science and engineering expertise right here on Merseyside. Through this state-of-the-art new ship, the British Antarctic Survey will help to expand global knowledge of the polar oceans and the impact of climate change on this crucial region. As Director of the British Antarctic Survey, this is an incredibly proud day for me, and I would really like to thank everybody here in Camel Laird who've helped build this ship, and to everyone in the British Antarctic Survey, engineers, project people, mariners, and scientists who've helped design this ship. And we're incredibly excited and proud to take this ship to the ends of the earth to try and predict our future. It gives me great pleasure to name this ship Sir David Attenborough and may God bless her and all those who sail in her. It is the greatest possible honour that this marvellous ship should carry my name and I wish good luck, good fortune to everyone who will sail and work with her. Thank you very much. This is a really exciting moment for us all. You know, this ship, the Sir David Attenborough, I've, I've seen it evolve from a pile of steel on the, on the floor of the shipyard into now, into this amazing state-of-the-art science ship that's going to allow us to do science that we've never done before. I mean, along with its massively important science impact, this ship is a, is a massive boost for us to fly the flag for UK PLC across the world. It's a huge boost for Merseyside and the North.